So ladies, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> a very warm welcome to the Global Alliance Power Fuels here in Brussels. It's the first time we are in Brussels. It's a start, but it's not the end. We are pretty certain that we will be here more often because, I mean, Europe is important. And some say Europe is lacking of ideas. I think we do have very important ideas and plans and projects. So that is a good reason to come here uh, on a on a more often base. Well, very warm welcome not only to you who are here, but also to our special guests from all over the world. We had many people from different countries who were interested in what we are doing here today. So we decided to put it in the internet and uh, we are very curious who is listening and those who are, are of course welcome to send us mails and information and impressions of what we are doing. The motto of today's event is power fuels in the European energy transition, the need for effective regulation. Well, with the second part of the title, you can certainly all start something. The need for effective regulation of energy systems and transformation in Europe is a well-known topic indeed. The first part of the title is a bit more unusual for some of you, and it raises the question, what are power fuels? Well, this is just a complicated uh, graph you can see here, but uh, maybe let me describe it in a, in a few words. In our definition, power fuels are gases or liquid fuels and feedstocks produced using renewable electricity. This includes, but is not limited to, hydrogen, synthetic gas and synthetic liquid fuels and feedstocks. We very often forget feedstocks when we talk about uh, climate change and all the necessities uh, we have to do. By power fuels, we mean the whole range of green electricity-based and climate-neutral fuels and do not exclude any process or technology. That's why we are showing you on this slide all the different options uh, where you can use uh, power fuels. And it's, um, well, it looks complicated, but it's on the other hand as well promising and all the technologies behind it are still at the very beginning and we see lots of potential here. Let me give you some information on the Global Alliance of Power Fuels. The Alliance was launched in September 2018 and its members are diverse companies so far. We are still looking for new and more uh, companies and partners to follow us. We have automotive companies, logistic companies, energy suppliers and renewable energy companies. The majority of our companies are European and operate worldwide. And this is the second important premise of the Alliance, the global approach. Well, the reason for that is kind of clear. Mm. Climate change is a global issue. And if we really want to address power fuels, and if we really want to be successful with power fuels, uh, we need to have a global market for power fuels. And there are lots of things you can talk about it uh, later on. Um, where you can see how important and difficult it is to create such a global market. Well, on this slide, you see like a figure from IRENA, and you, you see like, that um, well, all the work we have to do when it comes to renewables in the different sectors. And uh, we all know that uh, even if we are successful on these passes, which are described here, it might not be enough at the end. If we really want to keep on track on the two degree Celsius scenario, or keep on track or want to reach that track, we probably have to do much more. And I think that is one of the bigger problems that we kind of neglect the potential there might be. We are pretty much focused on some specific issues, wind and solar, for example, and the renewables, yes, and, uh, but we still are not able to see all the potentials, what we can do with the renewables in order to maybe trade them on a cross-border level, for example. There are many ways to reduce carbon dioxide consumptions, and of course, renewable, the direct use of uh, renewable energy in electricity, of course, is one. Energy efficiency, one of the other underestimated targets of global energy transition, is the second. But we think power fuels are another very important pillar of what we have to do. Yeah, maybe we could even say there are three pillars at the moment 
for um, our pathway to reach climate targets so far. What we call power fuels a missing link to global energy transition. I think that's a pretty bit big word, I know that, but I mean that at least gives you the impression that we are kind of convinced that there is a lack of something. And we don't know whether it really will solve the problem or, or whether it will just be a joker. We have a pretty good feeling that it can contribute to solving the problems we have. It needs lots of work and there might be even other options coming ahead, but for the moment that is the best one we see. Power fuels enable the energy transition in quite a variety of different things. Well, they can utilize the worldwide renewable electricity production potential as they can be transported and traded globally. They offer climate-friendly solutions for applications with no viable alternatives. They reduce the cost of energy trans transition by making use of existing infrastructures and providing long-term storage, storage options. And here you see that this, of course, depends very much on the country where you live in. Because every country has different infrastructures and in some countries, it's especially true for, the, for Germany, we're wondering what will happen to all the infrastructures we, we have. Do, don't we need them anymore? If so, fine, then we have to get rid of them. But if there is an option to really use them, maybe it can solve some other problems we might have in future. Well, they can also accelerate the defossilization of consumers' existing technical devices and applications. And that is true for all sectors uh, we analyzed in different studies so far. And sometimes we, of course, hear about the efficiency issue. Yeah, it's not. It's much more efficient to use electricity and your renewable electricity on a direct way. But sometimes, if we have a system approach, it might be more complicated to use uh, direct electricity uh, consumption, and we probably need some systemic uh, values we could use by using power fuels. Well, there are a couple of principles for political action. Yes, cost efficiency is one. Focus on greenhouse gas emission reduction and sustainability. I think that is key in a world like this. Investment and planning security, of course. Emphasis on, um, on polluter pace principle, overall strategy and sector specific approaches. So a different, different variety of assumptions. We have to, to follow some basic principles if we really want to create a new market, because if we do not focus on cost efficiency, for example, or on reducing climate emissions, then it's not worth the effort. There, of course, are some key recommendations. Uh, here you can see them. They are also in the paper we put in the little booklet uh, we had at the entrance. Uh, I hope you will have some time to read it. One of the papers over there um, focusing on the regulatory aspect is brand new, so we are kind of publishing it uh, today, and I think it's worth going through it, and we will discuss it later on in these different uh, panels we have. Well, now I did not introduce our fire speakers so far. That will be done by, by our wonderful moderator. Uh, who will just follow in a moment, but I, oh yeah, this is a bit embarrassing, I have to find your name again. <laughs> Meredith, Meredith Annex <laughs> from <laughs> Bloomberg New Energy Finance, so this is all what I wanted to say at the beginning. We are very happy to have you, and we are very much looking forward into good discussions, and you will give us uh, more details on that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. So I understand that this uh, podium is not going to stay around for the whole time. So I will uh, try not to get comfortable there and I will will take up to the stage. So I'll be very brief in introducing our speakers. We're going to have three impulses and then we're going to open it up to a audience conversation is the way that we should say it rather than a Q&A. Uh, I'll give some more details once our speakers are done, but some of you have pre-elected to show up on stage. If so, don't be surprised if you get called on. And if you didn't pre-elect to come on stage but have had a change of heart and are so excited by the conversation that you want to come up later, then please feel free to do so. Uh, so that's enough from me. Uh, let's have our first impulse come up, which is uh, Christoph of Klimaworks. If you can come up. 
perfect. Hi, everybody. My name is Christoph, um, and the company is actually called Climeworks. And um, we are a Swiss company that has figured out a way to remove CO2 from the air. And together with hydrogen, as Andreas just pointed out, CO2 is a vital feedstock for power fuels. That's why I want to talk to you um, about CO2 from air as a feedstock for power fuels. But before that, I'm quickly going to show you our tech, uh, introduce our company, and then move into why power fuels is important for us. So this is uh, a direct air capture module. It captures 50 tons of CO2 per year. Air goes in one way, CO2-free air goes out the other. And we get a pure CO2 at 99.8 purity. Um, and also we make about a ton of H2O per ton of CO2 from the air. So those are our products. Um, and why do we do this? Why have we figured out to chase 410 parts per million? Um, the reason is, in order to stay within the Paris climate goals, we need to um, not only be carbon neutral in around 30 years on a global scale, but thereafter also become net carbon negative. That means we have to pull more CO2 out of the air than we emit. And the scales are tru truly mind-blowing, and that's why it is important that any solution can be on a small um, footprint. And that's why we engineered our machines the way we are. So what we want to do is we want to help reduce the gray bit, for example, uh, by uh, having a feedstock for power fuels, the CO2 for power fuels, but also we want to move into negative emissions. That means uh, take CO2 out of the air and store it permanently in either products like building materials or uh, in geologic rock for machines. Um, this is how our plants look like. Six of these modules fit into a, to a container, into a 40-foot shipping container. So you can stack them, you can play Lego, and that uh, enables you to scale this technology quickly because you can quickly build different size plants. Um, currently, we have about, we are 10 years old. We have 16 plants across Europe, from Iceland to southern Italy. We are about 65 full-time equivalents, 85 people round about with offices in Zurich and in Cologne. We're the world's first company to, to do what we do, um, and we mainly use low temperature heat, in this case, waste heat um, to run our plants. And that's important to keep our footprint minimal, because if you are in the business of removing CO2 from the air, it's very important that we remove more than you emit. So uh, currently, we are running at 90% efficiency. That means we need a uh, 100 kilo of CO2 per ton we extract for, our, for running our operations, building our plants. And this is for the first commercial plant we built. And uh, long term, we, we know how to get to around uh, about 95%, which means we need about 50 kilograms per ton. Cost-wise, it's obviously it's a new technology. It's expensive at the moment. We are at six hundred dollars per ton, and we uh, have figured out a way to get to a hundred within eight to ten years. So those are the the rough stats. Um, Scale-up strategy is we start with niche markets, uh, and then renewable fuels. And the biggest one that needs a price on carbon is obviously negative emissions. Um, as of January this year, we supply Coca-Cola with CO2 for, for their, their mineral water, so it's already in the stores, you can buy that. Um, and next, we really want to move into renewable fuels. So, with CO2 from, from the air, you can make um, power fuels close to CO2 neutral because you take CO2, remove it from the air, then you combine it with hydrogen, you methanize it, you can then start to build all kinds of um, carbon molecules. And when you burn the CO2, it ends back up into the in the atmosphere, right? When you take the CO2 from a point source, you use it once more and then you emit it back into, uh, you emit fossil CO2 additionally into the atmosphere. So with point source power fuels, you reduce your CO2, but you can't have a carbon neutral fuel. Obviously, we are still a bit more expensive. Um, but for scenarios around 2050, when we need to be carbon neutral, 
this is what's going to be needed. Um, I said when you do this, it's important to, to make this really small. So this is the 2010 EU energy demand. The large gray circle is the land area you would need, need if you would to, were to fulfill this with uh, generation one biofuels. And with synfuels from direct air capture, you can make this extremely small and the calculation there includes the energy you would need for the conversion of pulling it out of the air and making the hydrogen. And I think the last point, uh, the last impulse, or the second to last impulse I want to give is, if you're really serious about the climate goals, if you, if you really want to get to zero emissions around 2050, which is the, the long-term vision of the European Commission, you need to get rid of the point sources. And then you have a scenario where you don't have enough CO2 to make the products that our uh, society runs on, because we have learned to make you know, creams and fuels and everything out of, of CO2 that we dig out from the ground. So if that goes away, then the only renewable or sustainable supply is the atmosphere. Um, and that's, that's the, the last reason. I know there's a discussion on regulation later on, so I want to give one last impulse. If you're chasing 410 parts per million, it is obviously and will always be physically more expensive to get the CO2 than to tap into a flue gas stream. And things like the, the new RED2 regulation, where you, where you allow for CO2 from the air as a feedstock for these power fuels is great. But if they are on the same level with point source CO2, we will always lose on price. And if, if you don't have specific regulation for that, we won't scale. We will be a, a nice mid-sized company and uh, our founders will be rich, but we won't be climate relevant. So I think this is the last message and with that I'm going to close. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, could I invite my next speaker up uh, to give his impulse and that would be uh, Bob of Proton Ventures. I have one for you. Yeah, you press the. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Bob Deagen. I'm working for a company called Proton Ventures in the Netherlands. Um, let's see. Is it work? Yeah, it's work. So we are looking for the, let's say, ultimate fu power fuel, and we found it. So <laughs> it's quite uh, simple. Uh, and this is called N-Fuel. We do a lot of things the last 50, 100 years with carbon, and let's make a transition to nitrogen instead of carbon. That's my message. Um, here it is. The blue one is, of course, the nitrogen. Nitrogen is next to carbon in the periodic system, as I think most of you know. Uh, this is our mascot. She's called Monia. I have her with her in my my jacket. I should have it on in my jacket if I make a presentation, but this time not. Okay. Um, oh, back. Sorry, I'm going too far. <laughs> Can somebody help me? <laughs> That one, okay. Another one? Okay. I will start with a small, short video. If I hope the sound will um, be okay when we start started. Ah, it's working. Great. Oh, no, it's not working yet. Can somebody start this video for me? No? It's not working? Okay. Ah, great. Okay. 
Please note that music has an effect on the energy field, sometimes creating a massive surplus. We need to slow this surplus, otherwise the renewable energy will be lost. And batteries are unfortunately not light enough. Quick Inventor invented a way to convert sustainable energy, water, and air into a molecule which is widely used in the industry, ammonia. Liquid ammonia can be transported and stored in massive amounts, and in turn can be used to generate electricity, replace ammonia made from natural gas to reduce the carbon footprint in the industry, and sleeping ammonia creates hydrogen, which can be used to power cars or other industrial processes, making ammonia the carrier for hydrogen. All in all, ammonia as an energy carrier for renewable energy could play an important role in the acceleration of the energy transition. Okay, it worked. Uh, in principle, this is the message. I have some additional slides, so I will do all of it for them. A little bit about Proto Ventures. We are, as you saw, we are in near the harbor of Rotterdam in, in the Netherlands. We are in principle an engineering firm, small with 25, well, 25 people. We're looking at uh, uh, storage issues, especially uh, with ammonia. So we also uh, see ammonia as a carrier for the hydrogen. This is in principle what we do. We do, uh, we have storage facilities uh, for ammonia. We have our own, we designed our own small ammonia production units. We can also use ammonia as a tool removal for NOx and for N2O. And the last thing is we are involved in the development of a battleizer. That's a combination of an electrolyzer and a battery. And okay, I can tell you a, a lot of that, but that's not why I'm here. But this looks very promising. Okay. I think a little bit more about this uh, uh, scheme. Um, when you want to produce ammonia that's in the middle, you always need nitrogen. That's quite easy. You can take it from the air, of course, with, with the air sep separation units. And you need always hydrogen. Uh, at this moment, the hydrogen comes more, comes most of the time from natural gas, from methane. But we only need the hydrogen and not the carbon. So the carbon goes into the air, direct or under indirect. It goes with the big ammonia plants, it goes into the air, or the ammonia producers say, okay, we use a little bit or more than a little bit of the, of the CO2 to produce urea. But at the end, the, in principle, the CO2 in the urea is the carrier for the ammonia. This when you use the ammonia or use the uh, urea as a fertilizer, the CO2 comes free when you use it in the agricultural sector. So, okay, so in principle, we don't need the carbon to produce ammonia, of course. But it's the most cheapest way to get hydrogen. In this case, gray hydrogen. But the interesting, okay, I come back to, to that. When you see that there's a uh, Worldwide, at the moment, there's produced 180 million ton of ammonia yearly. That is one of the biggest commodities of this world. And when you go more to the right, it's uh, at the end, at, the mo at th this moment, let's say 85 or 90 percent of the ammonia, of the bonded ammonia, in this case ammonia, is used in the fertilizer uh, application. Okay, that's one thing, but there are things changing now. There's things changing on at the front and at the end. At the front, there's coming a lot of renewable energy, and it's coming cheaper and cheaper. If it becomes cheap, of course, you can produce green hydrogen by electrolysis. And at the moment, it's still, um, let's say, too expensive or expensive uh, in relationship to the hydrogen from natural gas. I can give some figures if you would like. Um, but it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. The electrolysis goes a few minutes. Okay, I start. Okay, that's clear. I go a little bit to 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 uh, the right. When you see, you can use ammonia as uh, straight as a fuel. It is done. I I show you a picture later. And the second thing is, 
that you can see ammonia as the carrier for the hydrogen because ammonia is on the mild condition a fluid. It's the infrastructure is there to transport it. It's uh, uh, already with 15, 18 bars and ambient temperature, it's a liquid. You can pressurize it until 15 bars, it's a liquid. So the, in the energy density of ammonia is very high because it is a, a liquid. You can crack it back quite easily if you want. You transport it, store it, crack it back to hydrogen, and you have again, you have again your hydrogen back. So if you look from left up to right down, you have your power, and at the end, you can get your power back where you want it. It's not about, um, let's say, the energy. It's, it's, it's that you want your energy in the right form, on the right place. That's the big thing. Okay, I have to make a few pictures now. For example, in the United States and Canada, uh, pure ammonia is used to, to put it straight into the soil. In already 1935, uh, ammonia was used straight as a fuel for cars. You see here the uh, United States, the waste to transport ammonia, big pipelines in the United States from the Gulf of Mexico all through the north and the Midwest. Uh, here you see a picture, I think, known. If you want to store a lot of energy for a longer period, you need molecules. So we have to go from electrons to molecules. So in this case, to hydrogen. And if we go to green hydrogen, we can use ammonia. Okay, I'm almost there. Okay, I can tell you a little, a, a lot of these things. This is what we have designed, small-scale ammonia production from one till 20,000 tons a year. This is the total uh, picture. Uh, here you see what you need as ammonia in, contra uh, of, uh, in relationship with, with hydrogen. I mean, there you have almost five cubic meters with 18 bars, you have 500 kilograms of hydrogen. Here you need already with 220 bars, with 22 cubic meters, you have only 350 kilograms of hydrogen. So it's quite, it's, it's, it's quite, it's better to, to use ammonia as the carrier for the hydrogen. Okay. Here you see what, this is an, a storage tank of 20,000 tons of ammonia. You can see how much energy is in that storage of ammonia, considering other options. Okay, and one very last one, <laughs> yeah, last one. Uh, very interesting option for ammonia is ammonia straight as a, as a fuel for the maritime sector. There's a lot of, of, uh, of uh, developments on that area and it looks very, very, very promising. This is another thing you can use, let's say, ammonia at the fuel station if there is hydrogen needed, is there a demand for hydrogen, you can crack the ammonia and have a little bit of the, 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 quant the quantity you want for your filling station. Okay? Thanks very much. Great, and without further ado, I'll invite my last uh, speaker up to the panel. Oh, Fab, if you could please stay with us. <laughs> Don't get off that easily. <laughs> Uh, and Benedict, if you could please join us now. <coughs> yes, good afternoon. And I, I just want to thank uh, first uh, Dana for organizing this forum, uh, for organizing the Global Power Fuel Alliance. Uh, personally, I've been knocking on doors in Europe for nine years now, talking about power fuels. <laughs> At first, uh, the doors were only partially open, and people kicked out and said, you can only do this in Iceland, can't you? Uh, but now we are talking about this all over Europe, and we're talking about this more as, uh, as real opportunities. And that's actually what I want to talk about here, which is that uh, we look at this now as a commercial scale technology, which is ready to f meet the challenges that we've been talking about here. And um, so what is Carbon Recycling International? It's an Icelandic company started in 2006. Our business is basically to build, own, and operate uh, industrial scale uh, methanol plants, renewable methanol plants, and we have built the first one in Iceland. Um, we have been marketing um, renewable methanol, that is a power fuel and e-fuel, since 2012 uh, under uh, ISCC certification and basically interacting with the RAD market, which is very uncommon actually because a lot, lot of the projects so far on this, in this uh, area have been um, primarily research oriented. Uh, or not oriented towards the transport market per se. Uh, what we're doing right now is uh, basically we're, we're working as a turnkey provider, EPC, of these plants, and we are developing projects both here in Europe 
And we've recently announced a project in China, which will do the first uh, commercial scale, as we call it, 110,000 tons of, of methanol uh, produced there from byproduct hydrogen, not from electrolytic. Hydrogen is not, not really a power fuel per se, but uh, applying the same technology that we will use also with electrolysis and have been using. Now, the general idea that you, of course, uh, are familiar with since you're here is to utilize basically renewable energy to produce an energy carrier that is applicable as a fuel and as also as a, f as a chemical feedstock. And so the difference between this picture and what you saw uh, just uh, a little bit earlier is that we are at the moment not closing the carbon cycle. So uh, like I said, I've been knocking on doors for nine years and, and initially it was uh, somewhat difficult sometimes to explain this concept to people, but I'm, I'm hoping that people are starting to understand a little bit better what we are really trying to achieve. So if you think about where this uh, renewable energy goes, passing through our system, becoming methanol, which is in itself uh, a fuel and can be used directly or can be used to produce a variety of other drop-in fuels, what will happen in any given uh, situation in mobility is that we will leave carbon in the ground. So we're basically, instead of extracting the carbon first and then sequestering it, extracting the carbon first, emitting it into the atmosphere, and then spending a lot of energy and money into capturing it back from the atmosphere, as long as these high-powered uh, industrial plants and processes continue to operate and are not elastic to our demand, meaning that they're not going to change their behavior just because we are going to capture their CO2, then, of course, we are leaving carbon in the ground and we are providing, basically, a benefit. And, of course, in a chemical sector, we are sequestering the carbon. Um, so why do we choose methanol? Just very few uh, points about this slide. Uh, first of all, <coughs> the production technology is very easily scaled up and down. There are no inherent challenges in producing at very small scale. We have recently been producing at a scale of one ton per day. In Iceland, we've been producing at 12 tons per day. We're very soon going to be producing at 300 tons per day. It works at modest pressure and, and, and temperature. Um, the process, because of the way it's is, is designed, is very easily scaled up and down. We're showing right now, for example, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the MEFCO project here in Germany, that uh, we adjust very easily to variable load. And there are no messy byproducts. That is, there's nothing you have to distill out that is uh, like wax, waxes or other um, hydrocarbons. So we have a lot of methanol already uh, being distributed. We can move from 100% fossil to 100% green with the same molecule. Uh, we're not introducing really thing, anything new in that sense. Uh, it, it combusts very cleanly, which is why there's so much interest, for example, in India and China in this molecule, because uh, in urban environments, it has provides that immediate benefit of not uh, releasing any soot, uh, uh, sulfur oxides and nitrous oxides. It is, of course, liquid, so it's, we, we just go into the same system, and uh, it offers this flexibility that I mentioned earlier. There are so many different derivatives that we already know how to make at an industrial scale. Now, in the background here, I, I've been showing you basically pictures of these cars that we use already in Iceland. Myself, I've been driving a methyl car for three years. It is basically a gasoline engine vehicle. Uh, no, no, no need for pressurization, expensive tanks, expensive new fuel stations. So, you know, we, we have to remember that we, when people talk about electrification or mobility, that however you look at it, under most of the scenarios that, that people believe in, this is, for example, from the oil company BP. We will need, <coughs> and, and the, the sector will be dominated by, by, by engines that run on fuels. That is the important part. Electrification will, even in 2040, 2050, still be only progressing very slowly. And so, of course, the, the, the sectors that will not be electrified, shipping, air, and uh, very heavy goods transport on roads, uh, you know, th those are evident. But even in the light vehicle sector, under most scenarios, the only a, a part of the light vehicle sector can be, uh, but can be easily electrified and quickly. So the platform we've developed basically, as I said, it, 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 it applies to uh, from a very small scale to a very large scale. It's, it consists of three different modules, CO2 capture, electrolysis or hydrogen capture, and then the conversion system in which I mentioned earlier very, uh, only the only product that comes out of that is water and methanol, which can be easily separated with distillation. Um, the plant that we have built in Iceland looks like this. So if you think about the diagram that I just showed you, 
On the right-hand side, you have the electrolyzers. In the middle, you have the chemical synthesis system with the compressor system. In the background, you have the actual CO2 source in this case, which is a geothermal power plant. It just so happens that geothermal energy actually releases CO2 from underground. This, this plant can produce 5 million liters per year, or 4,000 tons, from about 18 tons of CO2 that we capture uh, per day, uh, which is actually, interestingly enough, a very large CO2 capture plant. We still need a lot more technology development in carbon capture. As I mentioned, we have been selling uh, since 2012 to a variety of sectors, from 3% gasoline blends to 100% gasoline, 100% uh, use of methanol, as, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, in cars into greener biodiesel production, into fuel cell cars and ferries, uh, where uh, methanol gets uh, transformed directly into electricity. And by meaning that when I say that we are selling at competitive prices, we, we of course uh, compare ourselves to the best performing biofuels. That's essentially what sets our price. We're a price taker in that market. Now, uh, you, you, if you read reports in this, uh, in this uh, area, you will find very quickly that people either say the production technology is immature, it is still too expensive. Um, some other people say, you know, it's much better to use electricity directly, not to go through this uh, process. And uh, then there's another s set of arguments, which is basically that what we need are drop-in fuels, will stick to gasoline and diesel for forever. And also it's too expensive because when you make those drop-in fuels, then you have to use processes that are inherently more expensive. Now, to that we say, basically, as a commercial company, we already know how to sell this fuel, and based, we, we're not basing our plans, of course, on retrospective prices or situations. We're going to where it's commercially feasible today. Um, using uh, re uh, renewable energy directly, of course, is more efficient, as we heard earlier, but this is assuming that electric vehicles are 100% substitutes for all the mobility uh, that we need, which is, of course, not true, uh, as, as I mentioned. And the third argument that we need to drop in fuels, you know, uh, as I mentioned, the, you can make any of these derivatives from methanol, gasoline, or, or diesel. Why go there? Why not use those properties of being a single carbon molecule which, which emits less soot and emits less byproducts? Now, the, the main challenge for commercialization, I'm finishing, <laughs> uh, and this is also addressing what is going to be talked about here later, the, uh, the regulatory aspect. Uh, now, when we sailed from Iceland with our product to, into the European Union and tried to raid your villages, uh, nobody's getting that joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a Viking joke. <laughs> um, we, we found that it's not really a common market. There are 28 different markets, each with its own set of rules. That, that has to change. Now, now we have already two in which you have very differential treatment of the different options, direct electrification, um, older biofuels like uh, Yukume and so on. And, uh, and we have to prove that every single electron that goes into the production of power fuels is green, which, whereas none of the other options has to do the same. And finally, we, we cannot work with automakers. They, have, they reap no benefits from designing new vehicles for alternative fuels. That also should change. Thank you. Um, so to kick us off, uh, I thought that I would ask a question to you guys and then choose a member of our audience to come up and join us. And yeah, you can leave that mic for the next audience member. I'll give this one to you, Benedict. So <laughs> I can see that we've got the first one. So I'm going to ask um, one question. Actually, I might start with you, Christoph, if that's okay. Uh, so at Bloomberg NEF, we're often looking at what are the things that you need to do to make a new technology commercially viable. And what I'm very curious to know, so you've got 16 projects off the ground, you were saying, so what was it that, what did it take to get that first project started? Um, we needed to convince, I think, the stakeholders that the technology is, is feasible, you know, that, that we can, can make this work on the technology side, but also can make this work as a smallish, scale-up or startup company. Um, yeah. And so it was about the feasibility of the technology. Since then, have there been any other new barriers that you've had to, as you've now got 16? Oh, yeah, basically, constantly. And when we started, it, you know, science said this cannot be done. 
And then when we had the first plant, science said, well, this can't be done under uh, a, th a thousand. And now they're saying it can't be done, under, uh, well, a lot of, of people are saying it can't be done under 600. Other papers that now have come out talk about 50 euros per ton. Um, but I think, apart from that, what generally what has helped us is, is the, the recent IPCC SR15, you know, where we first, for the first time, really in, in a wider audience, acknowledge that you know it's not five to twelve it's twelve we have to take carbon out of the air again and then uh, you know people like us are not loonies it, it makes all of a sudden it makes sense but we have read these reports for ten years so mm -hmm. yeah. Bob and Benedict maybe one of you could tell us about your first project and and the barriers you had then versus now yes of course uh, want me to take a look I think you should press that up and you should be good Yes, um, when you look at ammonia, of course, um, the grey ammonia is produced in, in very, very huge uh, plants. Okay. And uh, you have a lot of economy of scale. So, in principle, uh, dead plants can produce grey hydrogen, I say, against uh, a cost price of, let's say, 1.5 uh, euro per, ki per kilogram. So, don't try to compete with that grey hydrogen. That's the issue. So if you, if you have your renewable energy, I think you should be al already al uh, be, uh, happy when you are around four or, or five euro per kilogram hydrogen. So in principle, you make a, a, another product, hydrogen and green ammonia. So there must also be another market for green ammonia. But it mm -hmm. comes a little bit closer because there is a CO2 tax going on, the electrolyzers are getting more uh, uh, cheap, less expensive. So it's coming together. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Thank you. That it end. Um, the question is, whether, how, how, what are the barriers for our first project? Yes. So uh -huh. I would say that um, we, we actually had a, a set of investors that were very, very far-sighted. And they actually decided to invest in this technology, even though it wasn't proven that the market was there or that the, the technology would actually work. We had a small pilot. So th that first step was very risky, you know, um, quite a lot of investment in, in, in showing that you could for the first time actually do this in an industrial scale. But then after that, we then faced this uh, issue of what about the, uh, for the EU market? You know, um, we, we went to the member states and they basically had not understood the <laughs> renewable energy directive the way that the uh, commission understood it, which is that you can transform electricity into fuel and that is renewable. And so the first country to actually do a change in that was the Netherlands. But they did it very specifically. They said the, uh, the, the CO2 has to come from geothermal sources and the energy as well. So we still actually, we have, we have seen that uh, Italy, for example, has transposed this, this the full directive, uh, the, this part of it the, the, from the first one. But now we're waiting for the member states to really start doing this. Um, the UK is actually another that has done this. Uh, so. As I, said, as I said earlier, the, the, the real thing is that the market is not uh, open and not common. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We have our first member of the audience, if you will. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. My name is Christoph Jugel. I'm Director of Energy Systems at the German Energy Agency, and I'm responsible for the Global Alliance Power Fuels. And actually, I'm sitting here just to show how this works, because this is supposed to be a highly interactive discussion, and we are inviting all of you, as soon as there's a chair empty, to just come up on the stage, take this chair, and share your perspectives, your views with us. And this is just the start that I'm going to give in here. So we've heard in the beginning from Andreas Kuhlmann that power fuels are the missing link for a successful energy transition. And we've heard that power fuels include energy carriers as well as feedstocks. And we've been discussing about ammonia and about um, methanol and others. Now I just wanted to highlight that in the brochures you just got when registering in here, there's a couple of fact sheets in there. And one of these fact sheets is focusing on feedstocks. So we're talking about methanol, ethanol, ammonia and other things in there. But now coming back to this panel on here, talking about technologies, talking about electrolyzers, carbon capture, synthesis. Now the big question for getting power fuels get real is the market ramp up. And with ramp up, this means scale. And we're talking about industrial scale. So what's your personal view up here? Is scale achieved by making the single size of a single plant bigger? So is it bigger electrolyzers, bigger carbon catcher plants? Or is it achieved by having a modular approach, meaning just having 
a, a thousand of similar smaller devices that are adding to scale up. What, what's your view on this? Well, obviously, as, I, as I've shown, our view is, is modular um, for two reasons. A, you can, you can build different size projects quickly, and, and we think you know, speed is, is key. And also, if you need to ship thousands of these, you better fit within the existing transportation system, which is, is the container. And, and that's why we've gone for, for the modular. But competitors, well, we don't call them competitors, other companies doing the same thing, because the problem or the market is big enough, they have gone for these these big, you know, what installations. And obviously, if they get to build that big one, they can have a cost reductions quicker. And then the question becomes, how does the market look like? And and we, th because we want to go from a niche market to this negative emissions. Ultimately, we need to stay flexible. But so meaning your standard plant size is. A standard container? No, uh, it can be a sixth of a container. So, so six of those, fit, six of these modules fit into a container. It might change in the future, and we just take the whole container, get rid of the walls, and, and but the, the container will likely stay for a while. And when talking about industrial scale, this is how you're scaling up, right? Yes. Yeah. Benedict, yours has also been. Uh, you said multiple different sizes. Right. Uh, so are you also going for a modular approach, or are these a larger project overall? It's a very good question, because we are sort of in the middle of it right now. We are we're actually looking at three projects. One is 50,000 tons per year, one is 100,000 or a little above 100,000 tons a year, and the third one is 250. So you just take what you have, so to speak, and you, you start from there. You know, we are at the, this, this very early stage. But our vision has been to standardize on, for example, a 50 and 100,000 ton unit and, uh, and go from there. In the, in the electrolyzer world, uh, we actually, when we started, that's another part of the story, we had, didn't have access to here in Europe to a lot of companies that were producing large-scale water electrolysis. And, and been waiting for that market to really start up again because it was, of course, very active in the beginning of the 20th century. And, uh, and now we're seeing that you know, there are several actors that are doing two megawatt electrolyzers. Some are, are thinking ahead and going into five or ten. And, uh, but for the time being, we're basically designing our plants around those two megawatt units, and those are, of course, then very modular. Great. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's both. Uh, our units fits, uh, we talk about electrolyzers. So when you have, uh, let's say, renewable energy projects, there are normally a lot of them between one and, let's say, 50 megawatts. So that fits with the existing, what's available on, on air electrolyzer, uh, systems and fits with our systems because for our 20,000 tons units we need something like 25 megawatt electricity constantly that's one thing and another thing i want to mention is let's say what happens for example in australia they they uh, producing they want to produce there a lot of hydrogen and they want to transport the hydrogen to let's say japan and the the, the big question is how to get the hydrogen to japan and one of the Perhaps the best way to, to do it is it in the form of ammonia. And in, in, that, in that case, you do it with huge amounts. And that's mm -hmm. the other side. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to look around the audience and say, if you've got a little daughter, even if you don't, and you want to take part in a conversation on modula, like modular versus industrial scale projects, uh, is there anybody who would like to come and join us? Well, you think about that. I'm going to turn it over to <laughs> one more question. But I do expect to see we've got one more empty chair here, you'll notice. And, and so there's plenty of room up here for someone to join us. Um, so then I'm going to ask what may be a dumb question, but I'm, I'm, I'm being here you know, for myself, but also for the other person in the room who doesn't really understand the, the nuances of this. How do you achieve economies of scale with modular? Is it all in the production size? Because I would imagine that you've got a lot of material that ends up getting reused in each case that you don't get to save on. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's not a dumb question at all. So um, with our plants, um, b because the shape is, is fixed, we can work on the R&D of multiple generations at the same time. So again, it's, it's speed, right? The cost savings, per new generation are not as big as, you know, if we would build massive plants, but over time we, we, can, we think we can do this quicker. And the, but the big one is, 
you know, once you have exhausted, you know, your, your new sorbents and your, your optimal module layout, it, it becomes capex. So the production cost. And, and, and then a big chunk of, of that would come from setting up automated mass production. Now, to do that, you would have to have a market that is constant and growing. Otherwise, you know, these huge costs are, are not you know, achievable. Um, and we are working towards that, but where we are now, you know, we will build one or two more generations, you know, basically one-offs, but then we really would like to move into, into that scenario. It's a bit like, um, like Tesla, where, you know, we, we've built a Tesla Roadster now, um, and we want to go to a, a Model E or 3, but, uh, uh, you know, building the production facility for that model is, is way, way harder than building that, that one-off uh, prototype, but once you can produce it in a, in a mass production scale, that is when the price really comes down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it is, uh, I think, already a little bit mentioned. Uh, Okay, uh, we, when we talk about renewable energy, we need electrolyzers at, at a certain scale. And it's already told that a lot of companies are working on that, and even talking about 2 megawatt, 10 megawatt, even 100 megawatt. I see, I've also seen a project where they're talking about 1 gigawatt of electrolyzers. So I think in the electrolyzer size, side, there must be things to happen. Mm. Absolutely. We've been joined on stage by two people, so I'll ask you guys to just very quickly introduce yourselves, names and company, uh, and then, yeah. Yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Joris Prost. I'm actually a professor in uh, Leuven University, but I'm not here as a professor. I'm more here as uh, someone who participated in uh, a recent report, uh, which was released actually two days ago by the International Energy Agency on hydrogen, which is now also publicly available. Uh, I will make it very brief because this is about power fuels and not about hydrogen. Uh, but I think the, the topic was uh, was raised uh, for good reasons because lots of these uh, power fuels start with hydrogen. Um, and I think the, the main message that I want to give here, and, and, and that is also the message that I tried to put in the, in the report from the uh, International Energy Agency, is that um, scale is, is really something that, that should be looked at from the very beginning. Um, I think that fuels uh, have been produced on a large scale uh, um, after the second world war we were thinking that we should do it big and uh, the bigger the better and uh, people have tried to build an industry based on, on that, uh, that idea if we and chemical engineers and i'm one of them are very good in making this uh, in a very good uh, controlled way on a big scale now i think that if you talk about power fuels and uh, the, the, the word power is being added, and what we see now is that power is getting smaller. Huh? Power is getting decentralized. And so power fuels, in my opinion, is something that should not be on a large scale. Uh, if you want to make it, uh, let's say, competitive and, and, and reasonable for climate, you should start from the scale of the power. And uh, I think that in the end, um, what happened before is that fuels were produced by some very big, lucky companies who transported it and got big profit from that, and I can say maybe uh, not looking too much to climate. Um, I think that now we are in maybe a paradigm shift where these fuels can be produced by the consumers themselves. Huh? They don't have to rely on big producers, they can make their own fuels. If a, a steel factory needs to anneal uh, steel in a very pure hydrogen atmosphere, they should be aware of the fact that they can make it themselves. I think that in the room now there are lots of people who are trying to produce power fuels. There should be more people here that are consumers of these power fuels and say like, hey, we can do this ourselves uh, on the scale that we need, uh, which is uh, way off 100 megawatt, I can tell you that. Uh, and so in the report, actually, when we talk about the economics, uh, making the hydrogen price at the low scale feasible with the gray hydrogen is something which is really within reach. And so that is, let's say, the, the message I think that uh, should be kept in mind when after using or producing hydrogen, you, you do the other things that you are very good at making it. So thank you. Great, thank you. And our latest new joiner. I'm Arthur Braun from EMPA in Switzerland. I'm wearing today three badges, one from EMPA, that's a Swiss government lab. Um, the other one is, actually, I did not come for this meeting to Brussels. I came today for a two-day workshop two kilometers from here 
uh, for the preparation of a European flagship. The name is called Sunrise. Uh, when, when you Google for sunriseaction.com, uh, that's a large-scale research initiative which is uh, preparatorily funded right now for the decarbonization of the atmosphere or concentrated sources and by means of uh, renewable energy, solar energy, uh, wind power, uh, with a combination of direct water electrolysis, we want to make solar fuel, solar chemicals, ammonia. So I'm very happy that uh, today you are making this here, and I just, I'm, I'm skipping a couple of sessions over there to come here. And I didn't really want to speak here, I came to listen, but I have a doc, and I will go away after my short message. I had a question to, um, to Climbworks. I was not aware that you operate a plant in Hinwell, and I am wondering how many, or how often, how many years can you take away my carbon dioxide? I'm living not far away from there. I know local farmers who certainly use the carbon dioxide. And I learned in the Netherlands, greenhouse farmers even buy CO2 and pump it in their greenhouses to make, because CO2 is such a wonderful molecule. It makes everything grow much better. I think it's a very good molecule. We, we need it for sunrise, otherwise it doesn't work. At what point would you still take away the publicly available CO2 from the far farmers, or they have to buy it uh, or make it with uh, machines that you built. Um, okay, so Hinwil was actually our first commercial plant, um, and the first customer happens to be a greenhouse buying our CO2 as fertilizer. And what we have done is we have replaced the, the fossil CO2 um, for CO2 uh, from the air. By the way, uh, my colleague uh, Dirk, Dirk Nuba, yeah, is in is at Sunrise Workshop. So, so you, there's another guy from Climeworks you can talk to. Just yes, saying. I, I know I, okay. okay. Um, um, and I, so, at, at what point will we take away the CO2 from farmers? Uh, I must admit, I don't really understand what you mean by that. I mean, you will, or, the, or your technology, which is great, will dilute certainly even more the CO2 over a long time at one point. No, and that, uh, ah, no. okay. No, no, no. So the, um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, and this is how, how the, the measurements work, this is why we know what we know in climate science, is, is very much the same all over the planet. And, and once we take CO2 out of the air at a certain point, it, it will mix so quickly that, you know, it won't change much, the concentration won't change much. But let's say we get to a stage where we take the CO2 away from the farmers. That means we reduce the CO2 content in the atmosphere. That is the happiest day in my life uh, because that's the day we, we have solved this problem. <laughs> Great. Are you sure? Because I have a question, a, a well, rebuttal for your points, actually, for the two of you. Um, I <laughs> so so one, one rule for this is if you see somebody on stage looking desperate to leave, please jump up and help them. They'll be forever grateful for you, and they'll get you your first beer later. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, so I want to ask you two something, because you've had opposite points. Um, you've made the point that we should be looking at the decentralization of production, because that is the general direction that energy is moving. And you know, at Bloomberg NEF, that's a trend that we've been following very carefully. But you've also raised the point um, when you were talking earlier, right before, right before you joined the stage, um, Bob made the point that you also have to match it to your consumer. So if your consumer needs a very, very large offput of methanol or ammonia, if you're working with, say, a large chemicals company instead of a smaller greenhouse, um, do you think that there is room out there for both of those markets at the same time? Do you think that one is going to be the first mover? Uh, and do you see a general trend where we're going to have multiple decentralized ser um, services servicing these one single larger centers? Yeah, uh, this is, of course, a, a very subtle discussion. It is not something that you can, uh, let's say, answer in five minutes. And no. there have been reports <laughs> out of that. Um, I think that uh, the, the general idea is that, uh, in the end, um, the, the consumer uh, the one who needs the fuel is, is the basic element. Uh, if it's a, a consumer that needs large quantities of, of these fuels, then you have to produce them in large quantities. If there is a consumer that needs them in small quantities, then you have to produce them in small quantities. And I think that uh, there is a lot of, of fuels already needed today. 
and and I'm I don't I don't have the exact numbers. I'm, I'm more in the in the technical side, but I'm I'm sure that if you look at the market, uh, there are a lot of consumers which don't need that much on the 100 megawatt scale. There are a lot of a lot of uh, consumers that that need uh, that need them on the scale of the power. So that is the for me the the first real opportunity. Um, and of course, uh, and then it's really becoming, I think, a, a complicated story about logistics and things like that. Huh? If, if you have to think about shipping hydrogen from Australia to Japan, that, that's on another, a totally other scale. Huh? Uh, I can see that, that these things are happening huh? because Japan has difficulty in producing uh, things on their own. So the, 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 the fact that it's, it's, the market is there, people need hydrogen. And so, look at uh, at, uh, at uh, I think this is just uh, the wonderful thing about the hydrogen that it's such a versatile molecule, and that it's going to be used in in different scales to make products to use it as an. Ad ad so it's it's really an opportunity there, and uh, the the opportunities can be on the large scale for certain things. And but I personally think that if you talk large scale, a chemical engineer will always do it better the way it's being done today. So chemical, but if you talk about electrolyzers. Uh, I, I remember my uh, basic professor, undergrad professor in chemistry. Electrolysis is something that you do on a, on a plate which is barely a square meter in size. Huh? So this cannot compete with a, a steam methane reforming. Uh, uh, so this, this is this is intrinsically, if you think about electrolytic hydrogen, it's intrinsically a, sm a small scale. Of course, you can try to do tricks. Uh, but it, it's a very personal, I th the main message is there, the, the market is there, some are needing big quantities of hydrogen, but definitely don't forget about the consumers, and they are not in the room, they are not even aware of the fact that you can make hydrogen electrolytically. Huh? Some of them, it's, it's really like that, there have been, of course, uh, there is a lobby of, of the big manufacturers, so some of these producers don't even know that they could do it themselves. Huh? Yeah. So that, that is, I think, uh, an opportunity which is still out there. Great, thank you. We have a new person on stage with us. Could you please introduce yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Henrik von Storch from uh, Deutsche Post DHL Group. Thank you. And I uh, followed the call of uh, uh, consumers being present and stating their voice. And of course, there are many very interesting aspects that I uh, would like to comment on. Maybe I focus on one or two that are maybe most interesting from a consumer point of view. And this is especially having uh, two companies present here that promote methanol and ammonia, which are non-drop-in liquid substances or fuels, which um, causes a certain challenges for the consumer, I think. First of all, we don't really see suitable vehicles. Or maybe you will now say do, we do see them. If we talk about heavy-duty trucks, airplanes, well, maybe ships there are, but it becomes a little difficult to find suitable vehicles for those fuels. If we speak about ammonia, I would say we hardly see anything on the market. And that is, of course, something that's very important to us, that we are able to not only get the fuel that has very beneficial characteristics from an academic point of view, but also have the vehicle, the distribution infrastructure, and the willingness of our personnel to use it. If we talk about a plane or a ship, we have highly qualified fueling personnel, so that might be okay. But the truck driver needs to feel okay working with this fuel and the procedure that relates to that. And uh, the second point that I would like to make is that, of course, energy density of ammonia and methanol is quite good but still only a third of uh, diesel and gasoline. So for each ship that would come from Iceland to mainland Europe or from wherever to wherever, we would need three ships in the future if we talk about the same size of ship. And um, I think, so or I'm wondering, I mean, both of your companies would be capable of producing e-gasoline, e-diesel. What would be your main arguments saying we still stick to methanol or uh, ammonia? Well, this is another one of those questions that you cannot really answer in just a few seconds. So, um, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that there have, have been no incentives for automakers or engine manufacturers to make uh, new engines for alternative fuels in general. Um, we are seeing, of course, uh, some interest right now, for example, renewed interest in, in hydrogen, but that is primarily because the European Union is putting a lot of money behind it. Uh, and so... 
any change you make will always mean that you have you need a little bit of new infrastructure, a little little bit of new engines, and so on. And but this is low hanging fruit in terms of methanol. There are engine manufacturers in China, for example, making trucks for methanol. It is very simple to do. It is basically a gasoline cycle engine using exactly the same fueling infrastructure and, and distribution system. Uh, the reason we we are not you know we, we are not against, of course, drop in fuels at all, and and you know they have a role. I, I think it's very interesting, for example, in what has been doing done with DME, with OME, and so on, and that may be the best choice for so, some uh, some of of our customers. And and we you know for example to make OME, which is a drop in fuel liquid at ambient temperature for for diesel. All you need basically is an integrated plant making methanol of formaldehyde, and that's all you need. So it all everything comes from the initial methanol molecule. Uh, but you know uh, there, there are these advantages that I mentioned earlier with, with methanol because of the way it burns cleanly, yeah. and that, that I think is important. And sorry, I have to correct that is not three times less energy dense; it's, it's twice yeah. as uh, less. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> sorry, and, uh, also, yeah, but but any oxygen, sorry, any oxygenate, and ammonia has basically the same energy density. Any any of those new alternative fuels are oxygenates essentially: biodiesel, ethanol methanol, etc. So they have lower energy density. That's just something we have to live with. But remember, when you went to the gas station 10 years ago, you know, and you were driving a car that was maybe burning 12 to 15 liters per, per 100 kilometers, you know, it's, it's not really something we haven't done before. <laughs> a little uh, adding from my side. I, when you look, you don't need your, your three ships. You only need a little bit more space on your ship for carrying the fuel. That's the only thing you need instead of when you use methanol or ammonia instead of diesel. So, so that's Christoph, not a big thing. And then I'll ask a redirect. Yeah, just to add, um, I think what you're basically trading is price uh, versus energy density. And, and as uh, you said, you, you know, you can, um, you start with hydrogen and CO2, make methane, and then you can form those long, longer chains via fischer tropsch or anything else, and then you have a true drop in fuel. And, you know, on those, you know, there are reports and calculations that, you know, if, if this uh, industry is scaled quickly, um, it can be on, on par with pump gas within a few short years. But, but in that scenario, you know, your hydrogen can be even cheaper. And then you have the you, you, if you look at it from that perspective, you have, you know, you can then choose where you trade price for, for density, um, right? And this is, I think, how you, can, you could also look at it. If that makes any sense. Absolutely. Could you please introduce yourself and then give your response? Hello, yeah. Um, so I'm uh, Volker from Sequence. We are one of the consumer, um, respectively, we are between as a fuel cell, methanol fuels and manufacturer between a methanol and the consumer. So um, just the to face the problem when we want to use uh, a liquid fuel, um, I myself made 20 years ago hydrogen fuel cells, and then I changed to methanol, and I um, take part with smart fuel cell, and we are producing 40,000 methanol systems and delivered maybe one million of the methanol cartridge and started 2003, and everybody was kind of scary, but it just works. So with the end user, we can they work fine with the methanol. And now I make the next step just to make a a fuel cell, which is a very um, has a higher efficiency, and that has a special uh, technology. We can use the uh, off heat to form um, out of um, uh, methanol and water, hydrogen. So that's why we have now a much higher efficiency um, than the direct methanol fuel cell, and have about the same efficiency than hydrogen fuel cell. And I think this is a critical uh, point that you. Um, it doesn't matter if it's if it uh, the weight is uh, half or twice. So so the system weight and the costs are are the point. And our company is making want to replace diesel generator in the low kilowatt range, and therefore we can really beat the diesel generator because we have the higher efficiency. And then even when the methanol has a, only half of the energy density, so we have in most cases the double of efficiency. And that's why we have the same um, also weight of the fuel. Is there anything you want to ask back based off of what you've heard? Well, yes, actually, um, about the confusion between twice and three times, I was talking about volumetric energy density, which is important for tri transport, whereas now I understand you talk about um, uh, gravimetric energy density, which is important for weight, which is 
of course, important in usage in a truck. Uh, if the fuel is lighter, that might be nice because I can then store more cargo. But if the volume is bigger, um, it's it's difficult for transport. And yeah. so, um, but still, I I uh, didn't fully understand. You said that you could, of course, further convert the methanol into OME, which would then be a fully drop in capable fuel, what would be the main reason not to do it at the moment? I, I didn't fully understand that. Well, uh, it's just a matter of investment, essentially. You know, the, the, the process is known, and it has been well described in academia and also in some very small pilots. Uh, but to make OME three or to five, which is what the transport industry needs, uh, nobody's doing that on an industrial scale. And so that, that's, that's what we need. May I... Uh Add something. I mean, um, we are now looking at renewable energy, and uh, what we see is that a part of the renewable energy we, we have to transform the electrons into molecules, so we get hydrogen. So I, I see all options. We could start with hydrogen, but if it is not needed to introduce again carbon, don't do it. So stick to electricity, then hydrogen. In, in my case, ammonia. But if you don't need Carbon, don't put carbon anymore into the chain if it is not needed. That's my statement. Okay. I think that's fair. Although I do see your point that if there aren't uh, an obvious pathway for you to use it today, then it makes the adoption process a bit harder. So I guess my redirect to you would be, um, have you adopted any uh, power fuels in your fleets yet today? Uh, and what was the initial drive within your company to start looking at this? Um, that strongly depends on the definition of power fuel. If you count pure hydrogen as power fuel, yes. Um, we participate in uh, research projects on hydrogen trucks. And um, we have recently announced that our own company called Street Scooter, which is uh, electric delivery vans, now also builds hydrogen range extended delivery vans, which are not on the road yet on a, on a larger scale, only the prototype, but will enter the market in 2020 with a small number of uh, 100 vehicles. Are there other consumers in the audience um, who've similarly had trouble? Maybe, let's just start. Are there other consumers in the audience who'd like to identify themselves? And I'll just do a hands raised moment uh, rather than forcing you onto stage. OK, great. So we've got a couple. So we saw at least three hands out there. Can you raise your hands if that resonated with you, the experience of trying to introduce power fuels into your operations? Yeah? Oh, one of them even is willing to come up and join us. Thank you. <laughs> My experience is that it can be very hard when you're the only one from your perspective up on stage. And so I thought I would introduce another consumer to the conversation here. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Reinhard Otten. I'm from Audi. So we are producers uh, and consumers with our fleet um, in the field at the same time. And um, yes, I, I wondered um, that maybe uh, our audience is asking uh, itself, uh, what the hell are they talking about here? <laughs> um, all the world is talking about uh, electric cars and uh, electric applications and maybe a, lot, a little bit about hydrogen. Uh, what, what are they doing there and uh, what's uh, the purpose of uh, this technology? I think uh, this is maybe not uh, completely clear. Mm. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. uh, I, I see some question marks in the faces of the people here. So what's Audi's perspective? Yes, we, um, we already uh, in 2011 uh, identified uh, the problem uh, that uh, storage will be in a renewable system of energy uh, a very important issue. and. Um, uh, the main reason was that we wanted to introduce electric cars into the market, but at that time uh, in, in Germany we had a chancellor uh, named uh, Angela Merkel, I, I think, yes. <laughs> <laughs> she decided uh, with, with her partner, uh, her partners in politics, to, to maintain nuclear power in Germany uh, as a British technology they wanted. Uh, to get out of the getting out, so to prolong uh, the, the time uh, for nuclear power. And uh, we have seen the contradiction 
uh, of having electric cars in the market and a uh, system based on coal and uh, nuclear power. So um, the discussion was at that point that uh, the energy company said maybe one day uh, when we have 30 or 40 percent of renewable energies, uh, we have been far, far away from that. This will be the maximum because it will not be possible to integrate more of this fluctuating energy into, um, uh, into the energy market, into the power market. And uh, so we said we need a solution for getting the energy turnaround going forward for the electric cars. But at the same time, uh, there is the need uh, for energy that, that can be stored uh, in a large scale, not just uh, for, for mobility, but also for the uh, energy market uh, itself mm -hmm. in order to, to have energy available in times of no wind and no sun. So uh, in 2011, uh, together with uh, solar fuel, we uh, presented to the public uh, our plan to make a power to gas plant. And this is running in, in 2013 or from, from maybe, yes, from 2013 on. And it works very well. And, and now we are at the stage, um, yes, already for a long time to, um, to find uh, the solution because um, it's always considered as uh, or you have electric applications or uh, this technology based on hydrocarbons or hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, or the one or the other, what is the silver bullet? And, and my message here is uh, that it's very, very clear if you, you look at it, you need to, the two. Yes. Uh, it's it's um, it's a combination of technologies you need. Uh, you need, of course, a lot of electric uh, applications to get the uh, very good efficiency mm -hmm. on the one side. But you also need energy carriers that can be stored uh, over stations and uh, continents, yeah. uh, can transport it from one continent to another. So. Uh, I think uh, this should be the, the key message uh, mm -hmm. also here. And yes, uh, we, we showed that that works, uh, 6,000 cars uh, in order to get back to the consumer are uh, running in Europe uh, on, uh, on e-gas. Uh, it's, it's mixed up also with uh, biomethane, uh, I admit, we, because our plant just produces for 1,500 cars. Uh, but it works, and uh, and we have studies that say that say uh, you can have this energy for about one euro uh, for a liter equivalent. So I think no one would die if you have to pay pay these prices, and uh, you, you can have it yeah. uh, to cover the energy needs of not just mobility but uh, all the other energy needs. Wonderful. So I'll open that up a little. Actually. Did you want to say something sp straight off the back of that? And, and go back, back again. Yes, I try to, okay, be yeah. I try to be controversial. I'm a, I'm a proud German, proud on German automotive industry. But when it comes to this now, I've, the, the card is my promotional card for my book. As a, as, as a scientist, I've made my business trips in Switzerland across Europe with a, with a Hyundai hydrogen car. So while the German car manufacturers are still considering, the Japanese and Koreans are all, already manufacturing and selling in Europe. I've been 25,000 kilometers across Europe from the North Sea to Venice to Bologna with hydrogen and these are electric cars. Much of the hydrogen was produced with green energy in, in Switzerland. We have only one hydrogen station, but the hydrogen comes from a hydropower plant. Uh, the Fraunhofer Institute in, in Freiburg makes it from their solar panels. Um, I think in Karlsruhe at the hi highway, they make it with partially with solar. Um, I think it's just fantastic. Unfortunately, unaffordable for me still. The Hyundai costs 60,000 euros. The Toyota Mirai, I think, 80,000 80, euros. But gasoline or the hydrogen, the full tank is 50 euros. And if you drive adiabatically, like I did for my hydrogen expeditions, so that was sports or really an expedition, the range was over 800, the range was over 800 kilometers with one full charge. And you pump in three minutes. In three minutes, the car mm. is full. Thank you very much. Crystal. May I just follow on from uh, what you said? You know, say it in simple words. I'll, I'll try one other angle. I think, you know, 
um, apart from energy density and all these technical and resource things, considering electric battery vehicles, there's another issue. You know, of course, you can electrify rich Western countries. But if you, I, I go surfing, well, I still try, I'm old now, but um, you know, if you go to Morocco, um, the cars are 40, 50 years old. Now, if you then think about us having to be globally zero emissions 2030, you know, a lot of these cars will still be around. And globally, we can't afford to switch them to, to Teslas. That's, that's just a simple fact, uh, unless we figure out something we haven't figured out yet. And, and in, in, in that world, you know, I agree, you know, don't put carbon in where it's not needed and there, there are no silver bullets, but you will need to face those facts and you will need to find solutions for those cars in those countries, you know, the 240D uh, W123 Mercedes that will that's, that runs since 40 years and probably will run another 40 yeah. years. That's, that's, I think, the other issue. I will say, we, we do see at Vinia that the, the cost of batteries are coming down, and we expect ICE versus EVs to become paired, like, uh, in terms of the upfront cost of the vehicle, to be at parity around 2025, 2024. But I, it is a fair point. A lot of these cars will be around for a while longer, and people who don't have the ability to afford a brand new car will still be buying used. We do see a number of, of ICE vehicles left on the road, even in 2050. I'm going to do a quick fire round going and ending uh, then with uh, Christoph over there. Um, so I'm just going to ask uh, very quickly, because we've, we've obviously pointed out some sectors that do make a lot of sense for this in some sectors where there is more competition from other types of technologies, whether it's biofuels or EVs or, or any of the other things that have been mentioned. So maybe quick fire, just what would you say is the sector that you think is the most prime and right for a power fuels as its solution? Too complicated to answer quickly. Uh, so okay, we'll catch you over a coffee at the break. Okay, the first <laughs> sector where you find the willingness to pay for it and the, uh, the customer is important uh, is the automotive sector and later on other sectors can take profit uh, from go going to this scaling up uh, initiated from the mobility sector. Great. <laughs> of course the automotive uh, sector is clear. I think the next one or, or uh, another important one will be the maritime sector, I think. The which sector, sorry? The maritime. The maritime sector. Maritime. Ships. Yes. Yeah, basically. <laughs> no, I think the, uh, it's the same thing. Of course, now, now we have to look at the automotive sector because there the incentives have been put in place, the mandates. The shipping sector is, is something that will need the solution very quickly after 2025 when the IMO starts to implement the CO2 reduction protocols. And so mm -hmm. that should come next. You got your thoughts together? Yes, I did. Great. <laughs> Aviation, because they don't have an alternative. I think that's fair. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. We've been talking about aviation, maritime, uh, road transport, about different chemical um, things. I'm saying things for wearing another word right now because what's interesting in here is actually that power fuels in all those different shapes do have one thing in common. They're turning cheap, cheap renewable electrons into very valuable molecules and this is one thing that's very interesting thank you very much for all your impulses and thank you very much meredith for your, your very lovely moderation on here thank you very much and thank you to our audience for uh, some wonderful participation as well Great. Is that okay, so we're having break? about 15 minutes a coffee break and afterwards there's a, a second session up here again focusing on regulatory aspect and in the session second, second session on regulatory horizons we want to focus on EU regulation, on market design, got an impulse from European Commission in here, we want to talk about different application sectors, talking about the transport sectors and others and we will talk about specific sustainability criteria that are necessary for making sure that power fuels are part of the solution, not part of the problem side. So let's continue in about 15 minutes after a short coffee break. Thank you very much. Great.
Okay, everybody. If you take your seats again, then we can continue in our second discussion round, this time focusing on regulatory horizons. And Sonia van Rensen, would you please join me up here? The stage is yours. You're moderating our second discussion round. So thank you very much for being here yeah. and have fun. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I had the pleasure of being here from four o'clock, so I've seen how it works. I'm fully prepared. Looking forward to all of you flooding the stage and me having to do very little but pass the floor from one to, to another of you. So my name is Sonia van Rensen. I'm a freelance journalist based here in Brussels. I write about energy, climate and environment. And power fuels, hydrogen, is one of the subjects that is increasingly flooding my inbox and uh, one of the subjects I find myself writing about more and more. So like you, uh, I'm here to, to learn more and to, to take part in what seems to be a, still a relatively early stage discussion. Um, is this going to be the next big thing or is it going to be something that we are not long, no longer talking about five years from now? So the, we started off with a technology panel that, that Meredith moderated, and the idea now is to really dive into the regulatory aspects. So to what extent, we're obviously talking about potentially a global market, but the focus here will be on, on Europe as a, a big demand center. To what extent does Europe have a regulatory framework that is conducive to getting power fuels off the ground and, and produced and consumed at industrial scale? And what kind of opportunities are there to further amend this framework going forward in the next couple of years to, 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 to help build the, the kind of scale we're, we're looking for? So the format is, is the same as what we had earlier. We've got three speakers. I'll call them each up in turn. They're going to each tell you something interesting, provocative, insightful. No pressure. <laughs> Uh, and after that, it's basically uh, an open discussion. So you can either indicate to me that you want to come up. You can simply come up and sit down. If all the chairs are full, you can also just come up and stand at the side, tap somebody on the shoulder, and they will get up kindly and, and give you their seat. Uh, and that goes to our three opening speakers as well. So you're obviously here to, to anchor our debate, but we don't need to have all three opening speakers on the stage at all times. So we can, yeah, we can rotate uh, as much as we like. Uh, so with that, I'd like to invite our, our first impulse speaker to, to come up and take the floor, um, Augustijn van Hasteren. He's a senior expert at DG Energy at the European Commission. He's a, a Dutch economist, has been working for the Commission for, for a long time, and the last 15 years of that on energy markets, so he very much knows what he's talking about. Um, most recently, he was the person that coordinated the clean energy package market design aspects uh, on behalf of the Commission. Um, his current role then, having done electricity market, is looking ahead to the future role of gas uh, and sector coupling. And there's been lots of talk of a, a potential gas package on the cards uh, under, the next, uh, under the next EU commission. So I'd like to invite you up to, to take the floor and, and kick us off with a, a flavor of how far we've come with the clean energy package in particular in terms of creating a framework for power fuels. Uh, I'll just give you a microphone because otherwise, hold on, that should work. I hope this is not deducted for my eight minutes. Not yet. Um, <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me being here to speak about marker design and power fuels. Um, there are many aspects to this. I'm not going to rely to you on all of them, even if I could. Um, but I think, at first, it, first of all, it's important uh, to realize what the Merck markets imply. Uh, when we speak about uh, electricity or gas markets, or any market for that matter, of course, the emphasis is, and the objective is, and the only thing they can achieve is um, cost effectiveness. Um, uh, market design implies looking at the operational rules of a market and see whether it can actually um, provide for efficient uh, uh, operational decisions. And of course, uh, the rules should be such that uh, the uh, signals it provides for investments are also the most efficient. It is not a miracle uh, weapon or a miracle instrument in order to translate general uh, renewables targets into uh, um, stable revenue streams, 
nor is it uh, uh, able to uh, internalize all kind of externalities. Of course, the more externalities are priced in, the better it is, and you can adapt to some extent the market design to make this possible, but I think we should also be realistic about the expectation of what the market can do. Um, in, under the past commission, we have done a lot of work on the electricity side. I mentioned this because when it comes to uh, synthetic fuels, of course, electricity become, will become more and more a primary fuel for the European energy economy. And there you see some of the, as some of the aspects of this package, of course, reflect a little bit the flink thinking which the commission has when it thinks about market design. Um, I think the most important thing to emphasize here is the way we try have tried to deal with renewables. Renewables were not in the market in the market in 2009, and when we looked at the design for the new package, of course, we wanted to look at all the characteristics which renewables have and make sure that these fit in well in the market and that the market rules are such that they can operate most effectively. So this relates, for instance, to if it's demand, if production is unpredictable, let's make short-term trading better and the opportunity for sure. So it has to do with cross-border closing times or has to do with uh, the ability of the balancing markets to provide correct price signals for flexibility to be incited in the market. What are the barriers for flexibility to come in the markets? These are related to the ability of consumers to participate in the market, smart meterings, aggregators, intermediaries, which allow the existing potential for flexibility to come to the market to be tapped, to be incentivized, and to make sure that therefore renewables can operate most cost effectively in a market context. Um, the last commission, we have done a lot of work on electricity. Um, uh, not just electricity, we also revised the energy efficiency and energy renewables uh, directives. So we have targets, we have an electricity market design, and we have very soon a new commission which comes into uh, the picture. So evidently anything that's going to happen, uh, so in view of the fact that we've done lots of work on electricity, it would be quite logical to look at the gas side, not only because we have forgotten about it for the moment, but also if you look at our long-term strategy, which we published in, in November last year, it is clear that it is about time we're going to do about the other energy carriers which we use in Europe. So this implies gas. Um, Evidently, whatever the commission will come up with will be a new commission to decide, but as commission services, we are thinking of what may be next. And um, what may be next, of course, will reflect how we think about markets, what they can do and what they cannot do, and um, uh, what are these new energy carriers. The question was raised, what um, regulatory framework exists for power fuels, and I think there's a very simple answer to this for the moment, none. So um, the, uh, the gas directive today does not cover this kind of energy carriers. So, the, uh, so there has to be, we have to be, we, 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 there are lots of questions can be raised as to what should we do today? Uh, is it opportune already to roll out the existing type of legislation that you have for the gas and electricity market um, to new energy carriers or not? Are we going to do too much too early, or in view of the very lengthy uh, legislative cycle which you have to commission, uh, too little too late? This is an important balance to strike. strike. Um, we have to look at all the barriers that exist for, uh, for these kind of uh, product, for the, these energy carriers to be rolled out. One of them has to do with level playing field. So this is not just within the market rules, but in fact also the the surroundings in which the market needs to operate. So then we talk about taxes, levies, and tariffs, and these kind of things, where although not strictly market design, of course, are very important for efficient operation and investment decision to be taken. And I point in this regard to the communication which the Commission has recently published on taxation and the future, possible future, of the Energy Taxation Directive. Um, so, there are many answers which you, questions which you can uh, ask yourself as to what barriers exist. Is there today a uh, obligation to have a connection code for power to gas installations? No. Is there today a, uh, a rule or a system or a methodology for, uh, for deciding what the connection rules are or what the costs will be? No. Is there, um, uh, is it so that, um, uh, no, for instance, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the 
the production, the, the exit routes for, for hydrogen production, for instance, are all routes feasible? The answer is no, because gas quality rules, in the, if you want to inject it in the gas grid, are not harmonized. And this is not just a question, in fact, about the, the ability of these kind of operators to, to make money and to operate in a market context. It's actually also an internal market issue, because if tomorrow everybody starts to inject left and right different things, we can say goodbye to the internal market because country A will not accept the gas in country B. Um, this is just a, a few things, but what I mean to say, what I really want to say is that we are going through a reflection process as to what what are the barriers for these energy carriers to 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 operate in a market, and what can we do in order to make these markets rules more fit for the future. So we are doing at the moment a study which is trying to in, uh, make a inventory. We are in the last phases. Mid June, somewhere it will be um, uh, published, and this will be the, let's say, the starting point for our next reflection. This will make an inventory, and then we will reflect as to what maybe, if the new commission thinks that they, this is a good idea, what you may want to do in the next gas package. This is everything I wanted to say for the moment. I hope it was sufficient. Thank you. Maybe let's keep it. Just one or two clarification questions right away. The, the study you mentioned, is that the, the sector coupling study that you've been working on? Okay, so that's, that will be the, the starting point for the Commission's further thinking. And then just to, to come back to the, the regulatory framework. So you said, okay, that there's no framework as such. The gas directive doesn't currently have anything to do with power fuels. But in the clean energy package, I mean, the renewable energy directive that provides the, the beginnings, no, of a, of, of sure, a policy. Sorry, sorry, so maybe so, can you so just tell us... Yeah, what do you think? I mean, what have we achieved so far with that, at least? So, uh, so the clean energy practice, which we have concluded so far, which actually was published a few days ago, for anybody interested to go through a few hundred pages of legislative okay. text, the, um, of what it really does is to try to restore the level playing field between, at the one hand, the traditional, traditional power uh, production facilities and renewables. So it contains a, quite a lot of mm. detailed and less detailed rules on how this, uh, what, how the future energy electricity system should look like. This is, uh, I mentioned, I think it's also important to emphasize is that, of course, this is important because what we, what the subject is today discussion will very much depend also on the ability of renewables to produce electricity and uh, to uh, do that on a level level field basis. Yeah, and beyond that, I mean, the secondary legislation that comes from that, that will also ultimately define what uh, what a renewable fuel is. Renewable fuels of non-biological origin, all, all of that is going to be, uh, I mean... Well, then it depends a bit how you want to, what, what for you market design is. In mm -hmm. my, you can maybe call it uh, professional deep, uh, deformation. For me, it is really about the rules of the markets. But it is clear that, um, uh, as I emphasized actually myself, the market cannot be the sole answer to, to power fuels or the stimulation of this, of this kind of more alternative fuels. So there are other pieces of legislation which may become part of that, uh, which may address these kind of issues. Okay, we can follow up later. Thank you very much. <laughs> Feel free to take a seat, I'll come and join you. Um, our second speaker then, I'd like to invite up uh, Yori Sivonen, uh, here from t and &E, Transport and Environment, uh, a green transport NGO where he's a clean fuels officer. He's been with t and &E, uh, for the past three years uh, with a background in, in bioenergy, previously worked for the European Biomass Association. He's Finnish, so forestry uh, is something that comes naturally to you. Um, he's also an economist um, by training, but he's here today to talk about power fuels and in particular the potential role he sees for them in the aviation sector. So, over to you. Thank you. Um, if we're serious about decarbonization, we're going to need power fuels or electro fuels. I think that's, that's quite clear. But we need to remember that we should first think of efficiency and uh, use um, electrify whatever we can. And what we can't electrify, then we can start thinking about electro fuels. So in transport, this means essentially two sectors, the maritime and the uh, aviation sectors. But we need to ensure three things. 
They need to be produced in a sustainable manner. They need to be used in a sustainable manner. And we need to have the right policy frame framework in place to ensure that all of this happens. So sustainability is going to be key. The, um, like with any other renewable transport fuel. Uh, there are two or three inputs in, into the production of power fuels. So you have renewable electricity. Uh, you have water. And then you have, potentially, you have uh, CO2 if you're making hydrocarbon. So with regards to electricity, it's, it has to be renewable. It has to be additional. I think that's clear. If we start using grid electricity, it means that any, any greenhouse gas emissions associated to the electricity production get transferred into the fuel, but there's a penalty as there's an inefficiency. If we use the existing uh, renewable energy, it means that the current renewable energy users are going to have less renewable energy in their mix, hence more gray electricity. Then CO2. CO2 needs to be captured from the air. I think it's quite clear that that's the only long-term solution in this. If we capture CO2 from an industrial point source, then uh, we're essentially just reusing the CO2, but the fuel is not circular. Then when it comes to water, we need to remember that these fuels might be produced in arid regions, and we need to also ensure that there is a sufficient sustainability criteria in place to ensure that you don't kind of allocate all of the water towards the production of these e-fuels. This also reminds us that we need sustainability criteria for these fuels because we might see the production of these fuels in a, in a very um, in ecosystems which are very um, vulnerable, or in um, a, a, or areas where you, you're not sure of who owns the land. The red two is the legislation at EU level which which defines these fuels as is as, as it is now. Um, and it's not sufficient. You have a few delegated acts which are, which are still going to be developed before 21, before the end of 2021. And uh, these are going to be opportunities to get this fixed, partially. And then at national level, we can go further. The red two also creates an uneven market with, for instance, green hydrogen, which is used for balancing the grid power, is treated in a different way as green hydrogen used in ships. If you use uh, green hydrogen in shipping, you need to uh, meet, qualify a uh, greenhouse gas savings criteria of 70%. And then you have other requirements as well. Then moving on to the sustainable use of these fuels. Essentially, we should be focusing our policy support on these fuels to sectors which don't have any other options. So it practically means uh, shipping and aviation. It's very unlikely that we're going to see planes or ships going intercontinental on batteries. Then we start thinking about advanced biofuels. There isn't that much of them around in a sustainable manner. But we need to remember that whatever can be electrified should be electrified. So this means that whatever you can electrify in, uh, should be done. So this essentially means cars. Also, within e-fuels, you have different production efficiencies of the fuels. Uh, making green hydrogen is much more efficient than making e-diesel. So we need to remember also, when we support e-fuels, that we support the right kinds of e-fuels with energy efficiency in mind. So what does all of this mean for policy making? First, we need to have the sustainability criteria. So this means that we need to have uh, the Red 2 Delegated Act done in a proper manner. 
So the renewable electricity needs to be renewable in practice, not just on paper. Then we need to have an LCA which reflects the reality. I think that's quite clear. We shouldn't be using uh, greenhouse gas emissions of the electricity grid from the future, for instance. <coughs> then on CO2, we need to have a nationally stricter legislation to ensure that we're going to be using or promoting direct air capture. This is a stale chip so far in, in the red two. And if we're starting to think about international arenas and, uh, and putting these policies or promoting these fuels in uh, IMO or IKO, we first need to have a kind of uh, good understanding of what the sustainability criteria are needed. And we need to have them also in our own legislation before we go to another policy platform. Then after we have ensured that these fuels are sustainable, we should start thinking about mandating their use. So at EU level, this would be a, a regulation on aviation fuel suppliers, for instance. For shipping, we would need to develop the infrastructure so that we can have ships which are powered by hydrogen operating in Europe. We need to remember that the building blocks of e-fuels that essentially you have the renewable electricity and the electrolyzers. So these are two things which are not going to be wasted efforts if we invest them in now. So these are kind of no regret options now if we don't have any development of the further processes. But we need to deliver that these, uh, we need to remember that these poli policies deliver on the climate only if the sustainability criteria are correct and these fields are considered in the bigger picture. We need the sustainability rules which are fit for this purpose. Otherwise, we're heading towards a mess similar to first-generation biofuels, first mandating them their use, then backtracking on the policies. Essentially, what I want to bring to this, uh, this discussion is that we need to have these fuels in the long term. And Aviation and shipping are going to be the long-term uh, markets for these fuels, but we need to get the sustainability right from the beginning. Thank you. So in terms of regulatory framework, what, what you would like to see the EU do is in, follow, in the subsequent regulation or the follow-up to the, the RED, the Renewable Energy Directive, is to, to stipulate that um, you cannot use electricity <coughs> from the grid. It has to be a specific renewable source that's going to your power fuels and that the carbon you use must come from the air. Those are the two for you, two of, two of the key yeah, the actions you would like look, look for Brussels to, to initiate. Brussels, as I or see it now, is not going to initiate on the CO2 of these fuels, but okay. that's why I mentioned that, that this should be done at national level where, yeah. you can, uh, where, where you could do this. In terms of the renewable electricity, um, there is this delegated act of the Renewable Energy Directive, which mm -hmm. is going to define how you're going to use green electricity from the grid. Yeah. But you can already now do kind of uh, off-grid applications. Yeah. with the Red 2 framework. And just one other question then, if some of this, as you say, will be decided at a national level, when you look at different member states, are there member states you see moving in certain directions? Are there some that are, which ones are, which ones are I suppose, going to be potentially the, the key movi movers, either from your perspective in a good or a bad sense, but which ones are the, the key going to, yeah, help shape this, this power fuels market going forward? What language have you heard people speaking here today? I think that kind of gives you uh, some indication. Apart of, from uh, Germany. <laughs> is there any, is this really still very much a German discussion or? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Is there anyone who's, who here is not German? Okay, your point is, has been validated. <laughs> right, we should work on getting other nationalities into this room. Thank you very much. Uh, let's turn to our final speaker then, a German. <laughs>
I may as well get it out of the way up front. Uh, Christoph uh, Timpe, who is here as, uh, from the OCO Institute, where he's head of the, their Climate and Energy Division. The OCO Institute, for those of you who don't know it, is a research and consulting institute that works particularly on sustainability issues. Um, and you're someone who's worked on all aspects of the, the energy transition, and in particular, more recently as well, trying to take the decarbonization of the power sector into heating and cooling and, and transport sectors. Um, and you're going to pick up a little bit where Yori left off and tell us some more about sustainability criteria and how can we ensure that these future power fuels are indeed sustainable. So thank you very much, Sonia, for this nice introduction. And uh, well, thank you for the ability to speak here. Uh, the final speaker is standing in between you and the discussion, so I will make it short. There is a little bit of overlap between what Yore told us just a few minutes ago and what I will tell you. I will use the opportunity of having slides to give a, you a little bit more a graphical impression of some of the issues which, um, which we have already uh, been hearing from Yori. So uh, my starting point is that uh, a little bit similar to what Yori said, when we look at the biofuels, we had the problem, or we learned that we created the problem by first rolling out a technology in having investments out uh, in the field and then thinking about sustainability issues and then having to scrap part of the investments again. So let's try to avoid this uh, when we do the next step now in the uh, power fuels. So let's make sure that we think first about the criteria which we want to use and second then about the investments. That's uh, uh, an important thing because the, the uh, power fuel will be an industry which has to be rolled out on a global level. We have heard in the first round some of the perspectives on that. So uh, we have to make sure that this is all going into the right direction. Um, the next message is also already touched upon by Yori. Efficiency first is also a principle which we should apply when we think about, for example, the electrification of road vehicles. This is now the example which I've shown here. Um, you could have slightly uh, similar debates or, or uh, graphs on other forms of transportation. What I want to say is, if we start on the right-hand side with the wheel power, in this case it's the traction energy on the road, um, we have one unit of energy and then depending on the efficiency of the paths uh, of the transformation, we will need more and more electricity depending on the complexity of the conversion path. So if we have a direct use uh, of electricity in a battery electric vehicle, then we need, for example, one windmill to power a certain volume of cars. If we use uh, hydrogen vehicles with fuel cells, then we need a factor of 2.5 uh, windmills, which means we will see more windmills on our landscape to cover the same need of transportation. And if you use uh, conventional vehicles with power to liquid fuels, then it might be more than five windmills, which we have to see. And renewable energy is a scarce resource. Uh, it will be uh, during the decarbonization, a global decarbonization. So therefore, it makes a difference whether we need one unit or five units. So therefore, wherever it is possible, let's try to stick to the most efficient path and uh, it has be already been mentioned, uh, shipping and maritime um, is, the, the, uh, is the clear preference. We also see very heavy uh, road trucks, etc. But we also should look at the, uh, at the industry processes, the production processes where currently a lot of fossil fuels is being used, and we will need power fuels uh, also for these processes. Now, um, power fuels, that's my next point, they are not carbon neutral per se. We have to look a little bit into the uh, framework condition to make sure that this claim holds true. And in order to uh, well establish that a little bit, I would like to show you a little bit of the arguments which we like to, or which we typically um, uh, exchange with some of the actors in that field. And I've just put that in writing, and maybe you just want to read it. Uh, I don't want to read it out to everybody. I hope that it's visible on the video as well. Um, so these are the arguments which we are exchanging um, and there is actually a very complex framework in which we are moving, 
And therefore, for example, even if we build new wind power plants uh, in order to power the, the production of power fuels, then it still makes a difference whether these wind power plants are already counted within the targets which the European Commission and the governments have or, and the Parliament have already agreed upon or whether it will be on top of it. Otherwise, it will not be truly additional. So if you really want to have something which is carbon neutral, we even have to go beyond the development of renewable electricity, which is already uh, planned so far. So we have to build new renewables. If we don't do that, and if, if they are not truly additional, then we will have to apply the average emission factor of the individual country or region where the plants are located. And this can be a quite messy thing. Um, this graph shows you the uh, CO2 intensity of power fuels depending on the input parameter of the electricity, the carbon emission factor of electricity shown on the vertical axis and, oh sorry, on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis you see the CO2 intensity. Uh, the gray line shows you a conversion factor of 70%, uh, which could be compressed hydrogen, for example, and the darker line shows you the conversion efficiency of 45, which could be power to liquid fuels. Now, if we, and as a comparison, you see the, uh, the, the yellow line, that's the emissions of uh, diesel fossil fuel. Now, if we have uh, data from the EU reference scenario, the latest one is from 2016, you can see that uh, the EU uh, 28, hmm? by 2030 it will not be 28, I think, uh, the EU 28 emissions will be in the range of uh, 200 and what is it, 240 or so grams per kilowatt hour. And if we apply this, you can see that in 2030, with the average emission factor, power fuels will be producing more CO2 than the fossil reference. So there's no way of reducing carbon by power fuels unless we really build additional renewables. We can add a few other countries, and this is why the scale goes so, so far to the right, because there are some countries, including Germany, which exceed this average and will continue to exceed this average of the EU uh, also by 2030. So uh, we have to First, decarbonize the energy system or, as I said, uh, build more renewables immediately. Or we have to focus on those countries. We have taken the example from France, uh, where we have already a very low emission factor. Um, and of course, if we have truly additional renewable energy, then we can stick to the zero uh, gram per kilowatt hour claim. And then we are on the safe side. Just to mention this, uh, Yuri has mentioned that already as well, the, the sources of carbon is also a very important sustainability issue which we have to address. I'm not going into more details on that. Second last item, power fuels imports. We have learned that a lot of demand will grow if we want to decarbonize the European economy and we will not be able to produce all that renewable electricity in Europe. So we will have to import a significant part of our demand coverage. And uh, if we think about these imports, then basically the same criteria, sustainability criteria, should apply as we would use them in, in Europe. Uh, that means additional renewables, uh, sustainable carbon source. Um, however, the, the regulatory framework might be very different if we talk about different parts of the world. So that has to be adapted uh, in terms of what we actually have to do to, f to fulfill the criteria. But we have more issues. Some of them have already been mentioned. We have a uh, scarcity of um, fresh water. Many of the areas where we think they are very likely to be exporters, they are very arid regions where there might be a competition for uh, drinking water. And we need quite a lot of this uh, water for uh, producing our power fuels. And we also have a problem of development of the electricity systems in these countries. So it cannot be the case that we develop our very fancy high profile uh, power fuels plant and next to it the society in the countries where this plant is located is suffering from shortages and from poor uh, electricity supply. So this all has to go hand in hand. We have to develop these countries. We have to help these countries to decarbonize by themselves. We have to make sure that we are not the front runners in the competition for low cost uh, uh, renewable potentials in these countries. So this must be a fair process for the uh, uh, development of power fuel in the uh, in the exporting countries. So all this should be uh, incorporated when we have the, the uh, future development of regulation. And as has already been mentioned, the uh, delegated act on the accounting of greenhouse gas emissions of synthetic fuels or power fuels is the most important step in the next uh, few years. 
but also in the national regulations and in the strategies of companies. I think the, it is very important to inco incorporate the sustainable criteria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just one clarification. So one of the points you made already in the, in the session before this, we heard that uh, someone said power fuels are not necessarily carbon neutral fuels. We heard about uh, the, the, CO, the source of the CO2 that goes into them, but you focused here as well on the electricity that's used to make them. And you said in 2030, at least in average in Europe or in some countries, power fuels will be producing more emissions than their fossil equivalents would do? That's correct. I, I would say it's, it's in, in most of the European countries, you will not reach the share of, it's approximately a share of 70% renewables when you break the, the line of the fossil uh, reference. And just to mention this, I mean, this means that you are on the same level as a fossil diesel, so that you're not saving, any, saving carbon so far. You have to go even beyond that to actually save carbon. So this is why it is straightforward to say that we have to build new additional renewables, otherwise we will never make this uh, goal of actually reducing carbon emissions. So that's with the, the current plans, all, all our plans, I mean, for renewables by 2030, but nonetheless, you're saying it would be better for the environment to, to burn diesel than a power well, fuel? I, I, would, I would say okay. the other way around. I mean, there, there are basically two options how we can solve yeah. this problem of the emissions uh, related yeah. to, the, to the electricity mix. We can wait and mm -hmm. do nothing, yeah. until the, the fuel mix is becoming so clean that it doesn't hurt to, to use it for power fuels production, including its losses. Uh, maybe it's the better option to advocate for an increased uh, development of renewables because of the development of power fuels. So then we can say, okay, we have built additional renewables in order to be produce power fuels. Then we can claim on a political level, this is carbon neutral, and then yeah. we can uh, kick it off. Yeah, okay. I might stay standing. I might move this. Just uh, so I'd say at this point, you're welcome to come up and take a seat. Um, I see Jorgo. Go ahead. We may as well. I've already had a few questions to so kick off right away. If you've got the microphone, just briefly tell us who you are and uh, feel free to kick us off. Like I said, the seats are full, but if one of you wants to come up, feel free to come and stand at the side and someone will vacate their seat for you. Yeah, you need to push the or slide the button up, I think. Go ahead. Yeah, my na name is Joe Shatsi Makakis from Hydrogen Europe. I'm the Secretary General. And I would like to comment a little bit on the, on the three presentations, starting with uh, you, um, Augustin. Um, you talked about RED2, the regulatory aspects. I think RED2 is very much based on the old narrative, on the narrative of last decade, the electricity only thing. Uh, Fine, but you mentioned yourself already the different aspects on calculating hydrogen. So if you ask me, just reading RED2, it's very complicated, it's contradictory, and it's not helping renewable energy to be integrated into the system. I stop there. I comment on, on you, CO2 from air capture. What's that? I mean, if you say this and you at the same time say we need, for aviation maritime uh, applications, we need hydrogen plus CO2. When will this be? In science fiction? No. I think, and Augustine was in the Madrid Forum, where we heard a wonderful presentation of my friends from EBA, the European Biogas Association. Biogas exists. It's a big reality. It's not us. Hydrogen is them. However, they have, Augustine, correct me, two, 300 million tons of waste CO2. It's biogenic. Circular CO2. This is something we can use for these power fuels or for synthetic gas because we need it. And why do we need it? And I turn to you. Der Spiegel, uh, one month ago, came up with the title Energiewende Murks in Germany. Murks means, uh, translated, Murks is. Rubbish, bullshit. Rubbish. Rubbish is good. <laughs> and they made a very, very simple calculation. They said, in Germany, we, 10 years ago, we discovered we need some 8,000 kilometers of power grid in order to achieve the targets. We built some 1,000. In 2017, 30 kilometers have been built. 
And this is the reality. The reality is that all this additional renewable cannot be captured by the system. Because at the same time, Der Spiegel says, we had a curtailment in Germany only of 1.4 billion, 1.4 billion last year. So I think we need to come to reality. Reality means that if we want to have added additional renewable, we need this. We need pipeline. We need hydrogen or CO2 pipeline. We need a combination of everything. And this is where we need to start to become very, very realistic. So the Audi example uh, of uh, power to gas and methane is very interesting. Of course, the best power fuel is hydrogen as such. That's it. Thank you. We'll give you guys a chance to come back, but let's go to our other new speaker first. Yeah. Um, yes, my, my name is Tobias Block. I'm from the German Association of the Automotive Industry. So um, no surprise, I have a contradictory opinion on, on power fuels or e-fuels. But um, let's start from the beginning. Um, right now, we don't see any investments. We don't see any investment because we don't have a business case right now. If we're analyzing business models, we have to think about target markets. What are possible target markets of power fuels? And um, my, my neighbor just mentioned the red two. The red two is not ambitious at all. The 14% of renewable energy in 2030 will be achievable just with the, all the multipliers which are included in this regulation. So the fuel industry probably won't be a, a feasible um, economic target market. Just forget about the aviation and shipping because um, this, these are international markets. Um, you have to find international agreements on CO2 reduction first when you want to see a techno technology development with that kind of target market. So what's left? Um, left are these uh, the target markets um, with really high CO2 abatement costs. Uh, many companies um, in the automotive industry are facing CO2 penalties. penalties. These are about um, 500 euros per avoided ton of CO2. If we re recalculate this um, to the production cost of e-fuels, it's around 2 euro per liter of diesel equi equivalent. So if an automotive com company would be allowed to achieve the CO2 targets with um, renewable fuels, um, we could see a market demand, an investment driver without any taxpayers or subsidies. And um, maybe in the future, these kind of fuels will be used in the aviation and shipping only because we see a lot of progress in the electric mobility. But why shouldn't we allow to use this driver in the beginning? That's my point. Okay, thank you. Let's get a... Get, give them a chance to respond and then we'll, we'll come to you. So maybe, Augustan, if we, to be fair, you did say there is no regulatory framework for power fuels in place. Nonetheless, can you just, I guess, come back a little bit on the, the criticisms of the Renewable Energy Directive, which two people have just said doesn't do very much uh, even to, to further build out the yeah, genera uh, renewable generation capacity in Europe? How ambitious is it? Um, I, it, let, let me put it this way. It was, it was as ambitious as we were allowed to get. <laughs> and it must also be said that the outcome was more ambitious than we actually proposed initially. True. So, um, of course, now we can have a discussion as to whether it should be more ambitious or not. But the reality of today is, the political reality of last year, July, is that this is the toolbox which we have to work with. So let's, let's make it work as, we possibly, as well as we can possibly make it. Um, there are, um, um, I, I, think, I think there's one, I, I think one thing has to be said as well, as well is that, um, and this is not the only place where I see this, uh, this discussion evolving, is that uh, uh, there are uh, uh, clearly there are voices to to let's say adapt or reopen or uh, let's say the renewables directive, but I think it has been part of a very difficult debate. Um, we even if not everybody was happy, um, there was there's um, 
um, that uh, we, we should be happy that it actually landed where it did. Um, and what I want to say is that it is part of a package. So opening it, it means not just adapting a little detail which we would like to change. It is actually opening the entire debate again. So having said that, it doesn't provide a very satisfactory answer. I'm fully aware of that. But at least it, it also uh, sets out the difficulty which um, would exist on the moment we would try to do that. And can you... This is, I realize this is perhaps more your climate colleagues than your own department working on this, but the idea, um, as Tobias said, of a well-to-wheel approach to, to vehicles, that would mean opening up the, yeah, the CO2 standards for vehicles regulations, which have also just been agreed, uh, either for cars or trucks. Is that something you, I don't know, as I say, whether you can comment, but something that seems more within the realm of possibility in the early 2020s or equally difficult? This, this is actually... F Colleagues of mine, which are even further away than my renewables colleagues, so I find it difficult to, to, to say yes or no on that. But I think the same logic applies to some extent. We came to a compromise. Um, it is uh, probably not the most satisfactory compromise for everybody. It's true, but it is the compromise which came from, com came from the negotiation table. Um, so it, uh, there must be a, a very good reason to, to open it. I think there, are, there, of course, there are scopes for discussion, especially because we have uh, the two legislative uh, acts which are still uh, to be developed on the Red uh, 2 Directive. And I think in the scope which the secondary legislation provides uh, for developing those, of course, there are many options open. And some options uh, are better than others. I'm not the one, maybe, to decide uh, which one are the best ones. Um, but, um, of course, there there is scope for, for still uh, adapting the framework or the thinking as to how we're going to deal with sustainability and the other uh, elements uh, in, in the Red 2 context. Okay. And then, yeah, the other two questions were about uh, waste CO2. Yorgo's question, we, does it have to come from the air when we have, uh, what was it, 300 million tons of waste CO2 from, from the biogas sector lying around? And the other question, aviation and shipping, is it... Is it really realistic to, to think we can uh, see power fuels go somewhere there without international agreements on, on emission reductions? And, yeah, very difficult negotiations at international level there. Yes. So uh, there was also about the, di the direct air capture, and I'll let uh, Christoph answer that. But, uh, so on the biogenic CO2, it's, uh, it's a very tricky issue because... If you look at, for instance, how, what biogas is currently, half of European biogas is made from maize. Is it a sustainable source of CO2? Is it going to be there for, for a long time? If we start taking CO2 from uh, uh, something which is inherently unsustainable, I don't consider that as an option. So if we are to do biogenic CO2, we would need to be also looking at what is the biogenic source of the CO2, and then we're going to have a quite small volume of this CO2. So you're talking about a few advanced biofuels plants making uh, ethanol, for instance. Yeah. So yeah, but half of biogas is still currently, um, I would say, unsustainable. Um, then when it comes to all the well-to-wheels uh, and the C truck and CO2 standards, I'd say that, that those ships have sailed for now. Uh, the tank-to-wheel approach it brings uh, a better efficiencies for the vehicles. And uh, like I said it in my introduction, that we should think efficiency first. It's not a bad thing that we're going to have more efficient vehicles. I think that it's going to be a good thing, actually, for everyone. Uh, then on aviation and shipping, um, a plane needs to refuel every time it leaves. Why can't we regulate this? Why can't we regulate the fuel supplier and say, that, hey, the fuel that you use in this plane, put 5%, 10% e-fuel in it starting 2020. Well, 2020 is not going to happen, but 2030 might happen. So that's, that's, that's something that we need to forget, that aviation and shipping are, are things that we cannot work on, because they're international. We need to first work on them at EU level, and then we can start working on an in international level when we have our, our sustainability criteria set. Yeah, and then we'll go to CleanWorks, and then we have just a, a question here. Yeah. Okay, just 
I don't want to do to, to double statements which have already been made. Maybe uh, two more points. Uh, George, you have been mentioning the, uh, the role of hydrogen as a uh, form of energy transmission instead of uh, electricity transmission lines. I don't really buy that point. I, I really see that we need um, uh, a chemical storage for balancing the electricity grid in the longer run. Uh, and we need uh, hydrogen and re-electrification, regeneration of electricity uh, from hydrogen for uh, balancing the electricity grid in the long run. For transmission, it is simply uh, associated with too many losses. If I produce hydrogen, if I pump it uh, through Europe, and if I re re burn it again, for example, in a gas turbine, then I'm losing about 80% of the electricity. Currently, I'm using 100% of electricity if I have to curtail renewables. But if you look at the situation in Germany, um, the numbers you have mentioned, it is basically less than 3% of the possible renewable generation in Germany, which is currently being curtailed. And the grid operators do not expect that this number will raise much over the next 10 years, because the grid will grow, the grid will be developed. So I don't see a transmission task for hydrogen, uh, at least uh, not in the near future or in, in the next decades. Uh, the other thing is I, I would like to... Uh, bring into the discussion the, the, the picture of, of phases of development of power fuels. Sometimes I think the discussion is a little bit mixed up because at the moment we need a development of the technology. I think we are not yet in the stage where we actually should have a mass rollout of this technology simply because we do not have sufficient renewable sources of uh, CO2, re uh, uh, sustainable sources of CO2, sorry, and renewable additional renewable uh, electricity. There is no framework for that yet. So at the moment, we need to develop the technologies, for example, for the electrolyzers. So let's work on that, and let's get this started with, with um, the, the, the right incentives for investments in this technology to bring down the costs of these uh, technologies. But you don't, do not need a mass rollout. In the later stage, when the costs have been uh, brought down, when the, the technologies have developed, then we will talk about a market diffusion process. And then we should make sure that in this phase, which is still limited in size, we will not have too much additional emissions. And only if the emission issue is really solved and we really have net emission reductions by power fuels, then we can go into the mass rollout phase. So um, maybe it helps to think in these kind of three phases. Mm -hmm. And I see this third phase only uh, 20. 2035 or after, uh, actually maybe 2040, and the other two phases will be until then. Can we go to, are you going to be brief? Because I want to come to CleanWorks. I, I just want to give some okay. remarks and then I will leave the stage. Uh, I just okay. want to say um, the efficiency <laughs> is included in the production cost. If I have only efficiency of 30 or 40 percent, I have to purchase more renewable electricity. So if I produce a diesel for one euro per litre, the, ef the efficiency losses is included. And we should start to compare the system costs of technologies and not single technology um, under certain um, circumstances uh, which, which are always chosen by the, by the same people. And um, one, one more remark to additional renewable electricity. It's all regulated. It's, it's in the um, ETS CO2 regulation. There we have a, a mix, uh, a, a CO2 footprint, which will be reduced even if we have additional demand of PTX. And if it is too expensive to build these renewable capacities in Europe, we will import the, the e-fuels. And coming from a fossil energy system where energy was expensive, we are going to renewable energy system where energy is really cheap, but we have a cheap, <laughs> but we have a problem in transport and storage of this um, electricity. So that, that's, that's a challenge we have to face, not the efficiency discussion. That's a wrong discussion. Yes. So, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Cleanworks? If, yeah, if I may, I, it's, uh, it's Climeworks actually. Climeworks, sorry. It's, yeah, I just want to come back to um, the question of, of scale and also on, on, onto the bigger picture. So, so you uh, said we won't need CO2 from, from, from air. Okay. He, say, he yeah. said we have a lot of CO2 okay. already available but and that can come, but that is, that is we don't need it right now. Yeah, Not that's yet. entirely correct. Um, and, and this is also true if you just look at the fuels. But um, uh, what I tried to say in my talk at the beginning, it is not just about fuels. It's ultimately about the Paris goals, right? And for the Paris goals, we need zero and negative, net negative. 
And, you know, Mercato Research Institute um, calculated a mean scenario of six gigatons uh, negative emissions by 2050. So that means, I've, I've gone through the trouble of calculating what this means in terms of scale-up rate, it's 58% per year starting now, right? So um, that's the other thing, you know, should we start scaling this at 2045? No. Yes, from the perspective of, of you know, renewable energy only, yes. but. You know, the, the picture is bigger and we ultimately the goal is to, to stay within the Paris goals. And you cannot wait until 2045 when those scales then become 200, 300, 400. Humanity has never achieved that. So I know we have to avoid the mistakes of the first gen biofuels, but we, we cannot afford, we don't have time to, to move that slowly. And, and that's why I think, you know, it's not a silver bullet question. And the other point that I'm off is it's not an isolated incident. You have to look at it in its entirety. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Rainer, you want to put a question yeah. and then I we'll only, get to I, the lady. I'm, my name is Rainer Lutgus. I'm EU correspondent for Energate. I don't uh, have a comment. I have a question uh, that I would address to Mr. Van Hasteren from the Commission. You said, I, I want to come back to regulatory uh, issue of, of power fuels. You said we cannot reopen the renewal by directive because it was hard work. But uh, is the, the, there is, there already exists the fuel quality directive. The provision of this fuel quality directive is that the CO2 of fuels has to be reduced by 6% by 2020, if I remember well. Uh, wouldn't be a recast of this fuel directive be sufficient for uh, to regulate uh, power fuels? Do you want to respond to that right away? The most honest but dissatisfactory answer is that I don't know. <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, but, it's but something maybe, that... Maybe that I should... I should I should make, I can make a bit of a general comment. In fact, this is a, um, uh, we're talking about a domain where um, previously there has been uh, no attention from uh, other than an R&D. There's been no attention as to what uh, the, the regulatory barriers or the impact of various barriers is. And now we're arriving in a point in time where in fact this silo thinking uh, starts to become very costly matter, and um, so um, where the and where we have would have we need to have a new look to the various rules and, and which exist left and right in order to see whether they do not pose a barrier for um, uh, for the development of this kind of fuels. I give a very stupid aunt, let's say example, but that is I think a pertinent one. Um, uh, if, if one of the ways to, to transport hydrogen will become blending in a, a gas network, today hydrogen is dealt with as a pollutant in most gas. You cannot in basically inject any kind of substantial volume in, uh, in gas networks. And it has to do not only with the gas network, but in fact also with lots of end applications, which for the moment are not standardized in order to accommodate uh, higher degrees of blending. So, this is just to say that it is, it, uh, it, it is not just a discussion of targets or what the rules should be or what the role of various parties in the market should be. In fact, it, it needs a more wider assessment as to what element in the regulatory framework today we can use maybe, but also those which actually today are a barrier for this de development mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, yeah, the fuel quality directive is something covered by your, your colleagues rather than yourself. I guess the problem is it's not been extended beyond 2020 for the moment. So it's there, but it basically runs out. So someone would have to actively revive it. Yes, we've got a lady on the panel. So, <laughs> and then we'll come to our two gentlemen on the end. Yes, go ahead. No, you need to, you to switch push around. the switch up. Well, I'm taking this one. Thank you okay. very much. Um, good evening. My name is Carola Kanz. I'm working for the German Mechanical Engineering Association. So a German again, but as you said, I'm female, so I might add to the diversity of the panel <laughs> nonetheless. Um, I, we represent as an association a large um, part of the manufacturers of power to X or power fuels, ranging from the wind turbines, producing the renewable energy to the engineering, um, the electrolyzers, 
um, up to um, uh, those um, companies that are active in producing mobile machines or agricultural machines. Um, I think those, those are machines that also use the combustion engine and uh, that won't be able to substitute with a battery in due time. And um, most of the time they are forgotten in, in the climate debate. Um, so we, we think that uh, power fuels do have a high potential and um, especially of, as a global market. And um, I agree that one day, uh, probably power fuels will be a scarce resource and there will be competition from a lot of sectors um, that have, don't have any alternatives like aviation or shipping, but we are not there yet. Uh, so we need regulation to get there um, and to, mark, to, to ramp up the market. Um, we as the mechanical engineering and the electrolysis manufacturers, we are actually ready to produce industry scale. We would like to produce industry scale. Uh, it's not, not, not about um, research and development anymore. It's about how to get there and how to have a regulatory framework. And from, from our opinion, um, there would be three things that we, we sh should really um, implement. Uh, one is a CO2 price in the non-ETS sectors. Um, the second is a reform, and this is probably more a national issue, um, is a reform of the taxes and levies. Um, some countries, at least I know from Germany, electricity is more expensive than fossil fuels. And if we really want to be serious about climate change and climate action, this is a situation that we can't continue like that. Um, and the third thing uh, is, is the market ramp up in those cases, use cases where there is the, where there's a business case. And this is where I would support the, um, the VDA, uh, especially when you look at the heavy duty transport sector also there, you don't have the, the immediate option of electrifying. And, and this is some, um, a field where we also see a business case and where we, w you would have the, um, the ideal market ramp up. Uh, last thing I would like to add, yes, please, uh, there, there should be an ambitious uh, implementation of the RED um, and also a legal clarity uh, for guarantees of origins because you will, use, you, you will have to um, need new uh, or additional renewable energy. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. You, your second point, probably on taxation, indeed, from what I, I was at a debate with the Director General for Climate Action, and he said the, the energy taxation proposal, which, which you mentioned as well, um, Augustine, the idea that the EU could move away from unanimity, he said, we haven't, e we haven't the council hasn't even said, no, we're not interested. They just, just ignored it entirely. So, so far, there's, um, yeah, it's not looking great on the European front. Uh, can we just take our two new speakers and then we'll come back to the rest of the panel. Good evening, my name is Florian Siebert from Erdgas Südwest. Um, we're part of the NBW group and in Germany we are the biggest renewable gases uh, dealer. We are active in production and in dealing uh, with biomethane uh, today. Now power fuels are a new option we are not facing yet, but we would be interested in investing if there would be the right framework. I would like to agree. I think the technology is there. We just wait for the legislation to, to arrive. And I would again like to speak about cars. There are now objectives uh, for new cars and also trucks. Um, and the objective is to, to uh, consume less, but the question is much less, what do we consume? So. If we consume electricity in cars or trucks, the CO2 emission is zero for the European Union. And we just saw that it's, it's not the case today. The CO2 emissions for, for electricity production, for example, in Germany, but also in other countries, is not zero. And for all the other fuels, no one is asking what is the real CO2 footprint uh, for these fuels. So we are just have the objective to consume less, but not uh, what kind of fuel we're, we're going to use. So I would just like to, to give this in, as a yeah. feedback, maybe even if, you, if, I, if I know that it's uh, a deal which is just closed now, the legislation we have at the moment gives no opportunity to have a, a real business case to start production of, uh, of e-fuels uh, because we would like to have an, a more overall view of the real CO2 emissions in the, in the value chain. If not, 
we might have a big amount of electric cars, which are in the statistics as zero, and uh, we say, oh, we have a great fleet, very ecologic uh, cars, but in reality, uh, this does not change the uh, electricity production, and so in reality, we will not reach the CO2 neutrality goals uh, of the European Union by 2050. So there will be a, a huge difference between the, the paper version and the European con uh, Commission, zero CO2 for electric uh, vehicles, and the reality. Okay, we'll just give her, yeah, you the chance to speak up, and then we'll come back to, the, to you guys. Yeah. I'm Valentin Partega. Um, I'm leading the renewable fuels um, research at Bauhaus Luftfahrt, so I'm from aviation. Um, and I was engaged a lot uh, with solar fuels, and I just wanted to say, uh, at least for fuel synthesis, water is not an issue. So we need one liter of water to produce one liter of fuel. And so um, if you show these things with power fuel then, and then dry land, uh, I believe the two issues when you go, um, let's say, to arid countries, one is, is the land you need to use. It's not for free. And then you need to discuss the social issues with these plants in these countries. This is much more important than, than just showing that water is an issue, but it's not, not such a big one. Then I want to say, um, for us, power to liquid fuel, these are really long-term options, and you elaborated nicely on that. We have other options to bring renewable hydrogen into the system. We can have it in the refinery, it is three days to re uh, regulation. Almost all biofuel pathways are deficient in hydrogen, so you use hydrogen somewhere in the pro production chain uh, to get a fuel at the end, and this, this might also be an option to have a power fuel in the system. And then there's another thing which may relate to regulations in the future, but which is also something important with power fuels, and it was completely missed so far here. And this is that, that it's a clean burning fuel. So in terms of aviation, it comes in at, at two occasions, and one is a health issue, and especially at the airports. So um, we have less suit emissions if we, if we go for power fuels, and the suits are um, related to the aromatic content in the fuel, and at least for fisher tropsch fuels, this, this is a clear benefit. And the other thing is um, the climate impact of burning the fuels at flight altitude. So this has a number of complicated components, but at least concerning contrail, contrail zeros, radiative impact, it's also related to soot emissions and to the aromatics in the fuel. So I believe these are two things which um, yeah, deserve to be highlighted more um, frequently, at least when <coughs> discussing power fuels for aviation. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, now, now you two get to respond. Go ahead. All right. So we're talking a lot about um, renewable fuels and, and other policies to fix the renewable fuels policies, some car CO2, truck CO2. Essentially, the goal should have been to get the renewables right in the directive which sets the re laws for renewables, the Renewable Energy Directive. I think that, that should be the starting point. You'll have a review in what, 2023. That's an excellent opportunity to start uh, rank, ramping up these uh, power fuels I up to 2030. So if you think about it, uh, advanced biofuels maybe 10 years ago, it wasn't talked about a lot. But they now have a specific sub-target in the Renewable Energy Directive. Why doesn't... Uh, e-fuels. Why, why doesn't it exist there yet? I think that should be then one of the goals for the future within the Renewable Energy Directive without trying to ha bring in other legislations to fix the problems of the Renew Renewable Energy Directive. So, so actually create in the review a, a sub-target for power fuels, for example. Why yeah. not? Yeah. Good point. And, and you're correct. Water is, uh, uh, what I remember, is the 1.4 liters per one liter of fuel, so it's not a massive thing. But it is still, still something that you cannot uh, It's much more. It's either the water you need for VESH, the solar, solar panels, um, mm. 
it's the water you, you consume for other, other purposes. So in a, in a chemical plant and so on and so forth, it's much more, but it's very low for the fuel synthesis. Yeah, but it's still something that we need to consider. Uh, uh, then in terms of, uh, of uh, power to liquids being more cleaner, does it take care of all of the non-CO2 impacts? Because uh, the way I see it is that it, it reduces them. But how much I, I haven't, I don't yet have the information on that. And we need to remember that if, if also within aviation you have the non-CO2 impacts mm. which need to be taken care of, but is power fuels going to take care of it completely or just partially? I'm guessing he's going to provide you with that yeah. information yeah. after yeah, yeah. this event is I'm over. Answering. <laughs> I'm answering. No, we, we currently we discuss a lot for the long-term future to fly with liquid hydrogen. There you have additional options. Um, but uh, it's, it's two things. It's the suit emissions uh, for the contrails, and then you have the NOx issues. And so the NOx issue is not necessarily addressed by using a power fuel. You have other options. But concerning suit emissions, um, it's way better. And it's, um, but this is also long-term future talking. And, uh, and it's a, but but it's, it improves on the suit emissions mainly and on the contrails. I would like to make yeah. two points, maybe uh, picking from the discussion, uh, Florian, you have been asking why are we promoting electricity uh, use for uh, transportation now and not power fuels. Um, there is a reason behind that. If you remember this, uh, the, the bar chart which I showed with, uh, with the slogan efficiency first, you noted that uh, for power fuels we need about 5.5 or maybe say a factor of 5 more electricity for the same traction energy. Now if you have um, a, a, a competition in terms of emission factors between electricity and the fossil fuel, this conversion efficiency is very important. So in order to be carbon efficient or to save carbon with power fuels, you need much cleaner electricity mix than you would need for the, uh, the direct use of electricity. With the current mix in Germany, we can already save carbon, or we're at least at level with the fossil fuels if we, if we look at the, at the uh, uh, battery-driven vehicles. Um, so therefore, um, uh, it is a difference which uh, efficiency path we need. So this is why we make a difference between the direct use of electricity and power fuels in that sector. And I would like to highlight something more. Um, I also see the, the dilemma which we have that the willingness to pay, as has been shown by one of the previous speakers, the willingness to pay for power fuels is in the automotive sectors, in the transportation sector at the moment. There's a strong need to act and there is high penalties. Uh, we have heard that. On the other hand, I'm really convinced that f a fully supply of the, of the car sector and light duty vehicle sector with uh, power fuels does not make sense because of the high losses which we have to face and because of the alternative which we have for lots of the applications with direct use of electricity. If you look at different scenarios which are analyzing the different developments, then you can see that for example, for a country like Germany, there's a lot of Germans here, so we can take this example. Um, if, you, if you want to supply the, the transportation sector by power fuels, you will need about 80% of today's total electricity demand in order to supply only the cars and the light duty vehicles with, with uh, fuel. So, I mean, this is nonsense. This does never work. Maybe you have noticed that it is very difficult, it's becoming very difficult to build any new windmills in Germany. So where does the electricity come okay. from? Okay, we have three new faces. Let's hear from the three of them. Yeah, we can have another, <laughs> free up another seat if you like. Maybe I can start. Kurt Wagemann, Dechmer Society for Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. And I'm coordinator of one of the large uh, Copernicus projects on power tweaks. All our analysis, the results, are very much in parallel with what Christoph Timpe mentioned, especially with respect to the uh, input of electricity and the CO2 emissions. And that is the reason why already more than two years ago we published a paper where we stated what we need are dedicated plants at locations which a lot of energy input. And at that time we also mentioned that, that could be a European case. We now to all, there was always mentioned uh, the import. When we talk about Europe, it's not import, it's production inside Europe. 
with respect to uh, wind power, we talk about northern uh, sea. And with respect to solar, we talk about Spain, we talk about Greece. That could be options. And as we very much uh, like the idea of the production at dedicated plants, not inside the grid, but outside, completely um, outside of the system, we very much also support the uh, global alliance of the DENA, because that's the, so far I understood the basic idea. And just one small sentence with respect to the water. Water is an issue. It's not only the water, uh, the stoichiometric amount of water we need for the process. Uh, usually chemical processes need a lot of um, um, industrial water supply. That's the reason why uh, the chemical industry in, in China is facing a lot of problems because of the lack of water supply. So what we need are technology developments with respect to the water splitting, the electrolysis, but also with respect to the processes to reduce the amount of water needed for the processing. Okay, thank you. Two gentlemen on the end. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Okay, uh, my name is Andreas Nietzsch. Mm -hmm. I'm, I would say, called a person of a society, so I have no company behind me at the moment. But what I'm surprised always, because I have uh, visited several of these kind of discussion, we talk a lot about technology, which is important, and all the reasons you bring forward are valid. But I think sometimes I feel that we are talking against each other than finding one solution for the world. I think some people have mentioned it. We have a climate change coming, and maybe it will go even faster than we can envision, and as we have calculated, because I believe 2050 is much too late. So we need to be carbon neutral much earlier. And when I listen to these things, and also in the political side I have I done, not only today, today, uh, today here, but in other places, I feel there is no urgency or maybe misunderstood. Because like the uh, election in Europe have given us quite some signals that there is an unsatisfaction to the politics done today. And there are problems not heard in many places. And I'm also here sitting here sometimes saying, yes, there's a lot of good reasons why not or why but I'm missing a blueprint how to make a climate change. So you say at 2035 or 40, we need to be zero. What do I have to do? Because some of your technologies are not available today. Some are earlier, some later, and none of them is worse or better. They have their role to play, and I think it's also for synthetic fuels. And I would like to see more common work on a blueprint and then to work on it. And there are a lot of reasons than to maybe make things faster. And, uh, sorry, my last word. In the political side, I understand it's very complex and difficult. I come from big industries. I work there as a uh, managing director, CEO. So I know it's not always easy to do things. But sometimes I wish more risk-taking, because otherwise we will not save the world. We will sit here and discuss further. I may have some great solution, but it will not make any difference anymore. <laughs> Uh, two comments. Okay, um, then we'll go to your neighbor. Yeah. When I hear the word blueprint, targets, specific, sector specific, you get excited. Measures, I think this sounds great. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's useful to remind ourselves that uh, uh, if anybody who has uh, been in this debate for the last one or two years um, has seen, for instance, that the Commission had six or eight scenarios on how to achieve the 2050 targets. Any self-respecting organization has in the meantime published their own scenarios as to how to get to the 2050 goals. There's a commonality between these various scenarios is that it's very clear that alternative fuels will play a role, smaller or larger, in the future. But the lesson from the learning is that, is that there are many, many uncertainties as to what the technologies will be, as to what will provide uh, eventually on our targets. With that, of course, I would not see, I don't want to say that we should forget about our targets. To the contrary, but, uh, what we really should realize is that in order to make uh, this uh, transition happen, it is maybe not the wisest idea to, to uh, pick technologies or pick roadmaps. Um, what is, um, and I, I emphasize this a little bit because it, um, a few months ago there was a very interesting weekend in Brussels 
on Sunday, uh, there were the probably more higher upper class of Belgian society who drove into B Belgium, but, um, uh, underlining the need for more ambitious uh, climate targets. But on the Saturday before, the yellow vests were also in Brussels saying that our diesel prices are much too high. So what I want to say is that is that we sh evidently we should deliver on our uh, decarbonisation targets, but we should keep an eye on the fact that this should also be realised at the least cost, and that uh, least cost is not something um, uh, which will um, uh, will be delivered by picking, especially in the uncertain times where we are today, uh, the winners. What uh, what is a? I'm not saying it's the only way forward. But what, what is clearly very necessary today is that um, we, uh, we make sure that the investors, which the people have to put the money on the table, are actually doing this on the basis of a real business case, of course, but also on a business case which is not based on uh, inappropriate uh, economic signals, so that when by 2030 we wake up, and we can say it ourselves, it's very nice if we develop this technology, but unfortunately mm -hmm. it was not the least cost one, and therefore societal costs have substantially increased. So I, I, I want to put some a little bit of realism in this is the discussion as to what what can be reasonably expected from uh, policy yeah. makers. Okay, we have two more people who are anyway going to get the floor now. If there's anyone else who wants to come up, we're already at quarter past seven, so now is the time to come up and queue. Otherwise, we're going to listen to two of you, get some responses um, as, uh, as need be, and then gradually start to, to wrap up. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, hello, my, my name is Tobias Brunner. I'm representing a small uh, engineering firm, but in my former life, I have initiated the BMW hydrogen program, fuel cell program. In the last three years, I have qualified a Chinese OEM for fuel cells, one of the biggest, um, and this is a very serious activity. I want to talk a bit about hydrogen uh, and about some myths, and especially on, on what I heard about um, emissions. Um, I have been at the G20 summit, so I returned from Japan yesterday, and I have actually listened uh, live uh, to the broadcasting and the first launch of the hydrogen study from the IEA. And there's a few interesting messages in there. The most interesting message is that even IEA is saying uh, in the very soon future, whatever soon is, but before 2050, we'll actually see a renewable hydrogen for $1.6 dollars per kilogram out of China, southwest China. This is very cheap, actually. Um, and that is the basis uh, for fuel. $1.6 dollars per kilogram of fuel is actually beating gasoline and diesel by far. Um, the second thing that we will see very soon, and uh, we have done the calculation for a while, is uh, cradle-to-grave emissions. I've heard today about well-to-wheel emissions, which is not the right measure to talk about emissions. You need to go cradle-to-grave, produce the vehicle, run the vehicle, and recycle the vehicle. If you take this into account, battery electric vehicles above 40 kilowatt hours are worse than fuel cell vehicles, and this will be a reality on the table very soon. Fuel cell vehicles have less emissions in production. They can have zero emissions in operation if you use renewable hydrogen. But even if you use hydrogen from natural gas, they're very competitive and they're better than diesels. And in recycling, you actually have a 90% recycling quota for platinum in uh, such a fuel cell, which is actually much easier than in batteries. So I pledge for, if you talk about fuels, talk about cradle to grave. I'm not even talking about what happens before uh, with water or resources. That's another challenge. But if you talk about energies, to cradle to grave. And um, as a last matter, I want to make a statement uh, towards uh, Mr. Dies from, uh, from Volkswagen, who was my former boss at BMW, by the way. I like him a lot. But he was fatally wrong in stating that the battery electric vehicle is the only choice. What has he done? He has shown us a nice slide with energies where actually synthetic fuels will last. Then he's shown um, fuel cells with hydrogen being worse than plug-in hybrids and worse than battery cars. And again, he's substantially wrong because he is actually assuming a 100% renewable energy system. And this will not happen within the next 10 to 20 years. And we never come there if we follow the instructions from Mr. Dees because battery electric vehicles with the current grid mix have much higher emissions 
than many other vehicle types, especially than hydrogen. And that's a reality. And my final statement for today is I came with a fuel cell car uh, from Düsseldorf. We filled it in Rottingen. I ha had a range of 602 kilometers. After the fill, I came here and there's still almost 400 kilometers left. So if the car is still here, I'm not sure in this area, actually, I'm not 100% sure, then we can drive with the one fill back to Rottingen after this event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our two ladies then, and then we'll... Hi. Yeah, you've got to slide it up. Yeah, that's Hi. it. I also work for a small engineering company from Bosch, small, medium-sized company. Ah, yes. Um, <laughs> based in <laughs> Germany, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to come back to the statement made earlier about um, where do we want to use e-fuels, and I think also what kind of technology will we need in the future. And I think what's happening a lot, especially in Brussels, is this assumption that we need one technology and that will solve our problems. Our road is called decarbonization or even defossilization and one technology will not get us there. Electrification is great, it has great potential, it has a lot of, it's fun to drive, it has a lot of great uses, especially in cities. Hydrogen is an amazing technology and range is, a, is great, hybrid with, you know, it, it's all great and it all has, has its place. And so does e-fuels. The question is, how can we use it, where can we use it, and in what time frame? So yes, of course, it will be used in ships, it will be used in aviation, because that's where we will need it in the future the most. Yeah, but how do we get there? Because the technology will not be here tomorrow. We cannot wait for 20 years until we will need it in ships, because let's face it, they are behind in regulation. They use way, way, I mean, we have problems in shipping that we have outdone long, a long time ago in, in vehicles. So the question is, what is the road that can get us there? And there, regulation really needs to step in. It has to, A, allow us for a fair comparison so that mobility need, transport need, and transport distance play a role in picking your mobility choice. And it, it needs to give investment incentives so that we do not, as industry, invest into a technology that maybe we will gain from in 20 years because that's not how business works. So it, the question is not, will we be using e-fuels in the entire fleet? Because no, we won't. Because there's more than one technology option. And the question is also not, will we use it in the entire fleet? No, of course not. So that's the, so the question is, let's forget about a, technology A, B or C, and let's say we need all, because that's what the decarbonization, defossilization requires us to do. So how do we create a genuine level playing field? <laughs> yeah. Which is what the markets are ultimately trying to do. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe just, uh, well, my name is Sonia Clarena from EU Turbines, the European uh, Association of Gas and Steam Turbine Manufacturers. So um, maybe to complement also about the use of those power fuels, e-fuels, whatever they are called. Of course, for us, um, the focus is rather on the renewable gases and uh, as well as hydrogen. But I would al also like to point out that uh, those gases will also have a role in power generation in the future. That's something that currently is very much forgotten. Uh, it's maybe not the immediate uh, use that uh, uh, one might think it makes sense, but in the future where there are even more uh, renewables um, which are uh, f uh, well, variable, they are not dispatchable, uh, we will need uh, uh, power generation that can de deliver fast uh, and on that the combination of uh, the gas grid where you have a huge uh, storage uh, facility for seasonal storage that then you can use, in our case, with a gas turbine or other technologies, I think uh, that should not be forgotten because currently it's really not, not so much in the discussion, but uh, uh, I believe it will come back. Yeah, yeah, maybe important to know, as you say, power fuels in the same sense is it's not fossil fuel, but power fuel. It's not fuels in the sense of a diesel or, or petrol replacement. Okay, thank you. Christoph. I you just came up before I think the last word then. So. Conclude. Okay, let, well, let, maybe a round of applause session. then to our, our panel, our rotating yeah. panel. So applause to, to all of you for having taken <laughs> part. Uh, thank you. And Alkustan, do you want to come back at all before we cradle to grave? Is this something, I mean, uh, a real level playing field at that, I mean, that type of system level? Is that something that's even conceivable? Breaking silos? to that extent within the commission? Well, 
I'll also need to be like that, like this. So um, uh, when, I, when you speak about the level playing field, uh, where professional uh, let's say deformation, I often speak about the market framework. But it is true, especially in this kind of context, there are other uh, regulatory elements which play an important role in incentivizing the development of certain technologies or certain, let's say, pathways for decarbonization. And it is, um, it is in general terms, of course, worthwhile to look at those um, because um, uh, any kind of, the, this, as long as they also they do not provide for level playing field, even, unless you get it very right, they will also be very costly. So societal cost, I mean. So there is a point in, in um, always keeping an eye on also this, this kind of distortions in order to devise a, a system which is really cost reflective. Yeah, I think the, certainly what I leave with today is this, yeah, how do we strike the right balance between giving all technologies a, a real chance um, and at the same time, yeah, not putting all our eggs in one basket, getting over enthusiastic about something, finding ourselves in a new but biofuel uh, situation, but wanting to scale up. So, well, we need sustainability criteria, etc., but we don't want to constrain the technology either. So it's a, it's a delicate and, and balance. I think it's also important to emphasize to that uh, in order to do this properly, um, it is one should not only look to Brussels, I'll say it a bit like that. Mm. Um, because... Um, you need to look to Germany too, as we... <laughs> not just Germany. In, in fact, uh, my first reflex is when you mentioned that there are many Germans in the room that they should mark, come more often to Brussels because they will discover that this is not just a German discussion. Um, but what, I'm, what I meant to say is that uh, there are, um, uh, if you want to speak about the level playing, in, uh, level playing field in, uh, in a large scene, there are many elements uh, which make a real difference, which in the end are not uh, a competence under the EU treaty. It's as simple as that. Yes, as Commission, we have proposed a paper related to uh, energy taxation. This is the third time we do this, I think. Yeah. Um, um, so the third time it's, it's been ignored. It's not for lack of trying, but we should also yeah. be realistic about who, in the end, uh, makes the difference on these kind of questions. And they are very important questions. Because uh, when the various energy carers, um, I, I mean, uh, it has emphasized several times, um, there's an important part to its uh, de decarbonization target is, is increased uh, electrification. Most costs, taxes, and duties today are on electrification. Um, on electricity. How are we going to uh, make this a realistic transition path if actually we put the highest cost on those carriers on which we count most to as our targets? I just asked the question. Yeah. Christoph, you want to answer that question and wrap up for us? Perhaps? No, fr fr frankly, there's no answer. You're absolutely right that all of us, we have to come to Brussels more often for together working on a solution. And this is actually, thank you very much. Um, my, oh, stay with us for a second. It, it's much nicer having you uh, on the stage as well with me. Too. Uh, actually, thinking about Germans or not Germans, why we've been discussing here, we've had this live streaming over the internet, and I'm glad that we had many people out there watching us. I've been in contact with people from uh, Chile, Brazil, Mexico, Canada, and here within Europe, I've been in contact with people from Greece, Spain, and Italy, for example. So, no, it's not just us Germans discussing about us, and I'm glad that we're together in here. From our evening's discussion, there were a couple of things I took away. One was, well, we had so often are asked about energy efficiency. And what our view on this is actually, that's not the point. There's nothing to compete on in a scarce resource which efficiency is really worth it, discussing it. But we're talking about applications where there's no other viable alternative, one thing. Or, or and we're talking about energy carriers, energy sources, they're not competing with our scarce, scarce resource on renewable electricity here in Germany or in the EU. Because if we are importing rene renewable fuels and feedstocks from somewhere else, we are importing renewable energies that would not have been imported in any other case. Those would not have been imported as renewable electricity. So energy efficiency is important, but it's not the limiting factor we're talking about in here if we're talking about power fuels. This is important. And another thing, what's absolutely clear, and I'm so glad that it's been repeated over and over today, is we need all the options. So there's no single technology, there's no single energy carrier that will solve all our problems. But 
We need all of them, and power fuels will play a role. I'm not saying it's the only one, but it will play a role. This is very important, and this brings me to my final um, takeaway from this evening is actually, it was repeated many times, we have to start now. And starting now is actually the one sentence that's closely connected to our overall topic, and there's regulatory framework in the headline of this topic. And this means we have to make sure that regulatory frameworks in Europe, in the national countries, as well as abroad for specific industries are evolving such that there is a ramp up of power fuels as the missing link, as the third pillar for a successful energy transition. And this is actually my last sentence for today. I'd like to very much thank you, Sonia, for being here, for being such a great moderator in the second panel here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I again would like to very much thank you, Meredith, for being a fantastic moderator in our third ro first round of the discussion. Thank you very much again. And I'd like to thank all of you that you joined us here on site, as well as all of you, I don't know whether I'm looking at the right camera, that you joined us in the, in the online live stream. I, I think it was worth a try. Please tell us afterwards if this was a good thing and if we should do it again with our next Power Fuels conferences coming up in many different places and all over the world for making sure that we all together are working on this solution together. What we, sorry for you guys online, we on site can do now together is enjoying our drinks out there. We're very much inviting you, enjoying drinks and food with us, networking and thinking together how we cooperate on this. Thank you very much for being here. Have a nice evening. Thank you.